When I was pregnant with my first child, I worked the overnight shift at a gas station near my house to pick up some extra hours. I know this may not sound amazing, but this gas station was beautiful. It was one of those full market gas stations, and it was in a really nice section of town. I know most stories that take place in these 24-hour settings are usually in dark and eerie places, but I never once felt that way in this company. Usually after 11 o'clock at night, it was slow. I would spend most of my shift watching YouTube or Netflix on my phone, talking to my fiancé or stocking the shelves. I didn't even get that many overnight truck drivers buying coffee or snacks because the gas station wasn't that close to any highways. It was an easy job, especially being pregnant, and it paid well, which was the main reason behind this job. One night early in my shift, a taller man came in. I shouted from behind the counter, Hey there, how you doing this evening? The man didn't respond. He didn't even look in my direction. He walked straight into the bathroom. That wasn't that alarming to me though if I'm being honest. I knew better than most at this point that when you gotta go, you gotta go. So I just figured that he just really had to go to the bathroom. After nearly 20 minutes, I noticed he had never come out of the bathroom. I was a little concerned and was thinking about knocking on the door to make sure he was alright. I slowly started making my way to the bathroom and saw that he had finally come out. I got a good look at his face at this point. He was as normal looking as can be. He was clean shaven with a tan complexion. He had short grey hair that was parted and combed nicely. Even though his hair was grey, he couldn't have been older than 40 years old. He was wearing jeans, a flannel, and work boots that looked really beat up. I got the impression that this guy was just some blue collar worker and he was just stopping to use the restroom. He walked right by me again and didn't say a word. He walked outside but didn't get in any vehicle. He looked like he walked to the side of the building. That's when I noticed that there was no vehicle out there. So whoever the strange man was, he must have walked. That whole ordeal was a little off-putting, but overall I stopped thinking about it just a couple of minutes later since it was uneventful. Part of working these late night shifts is you get your array of strange individuals. As the night continued, I ended up calling my fiancé and we were just talking on the phone passing the time. It had to be at least an hour later. The door opened and to my surprise, it was the same guy. This time I didn't say anything to him, figuring that maybe he spoke another language or something. Well, that theory went out the window instantly because instead of walking to the bathroom, this time he walked right up to the counter and asked in a polite voice, Hello ma'am. You can't say hello to me? He smiled as he said it, indicating me that he was joking around. I nervously smiled and responded, Sorry about that, sir. Hello, how are, how are you doing this evening? He smiled and only responded with one word in an abrupt tone. Jerky. I jumped back a little bit and said, Excuse me? The man then leaned toward me and in a polite voice changed into a more aggressive voice and he said, I want beef jerky. Where is it? I pointed over to the rack where all the jerky and Slim Jims were located. He smiled at me and now in a polite tone once again he said, why, thank you, ma'am. He slowly walked over to the beef jerky and stopped once he got to the rack. He was standing completely still when he said to me, You know, you look just like a Disney princess. I was a bit creeped out but said thank you anyway, just figuring that he was trying to be nice. I look like a lot of things, but one thing I do not look like is a Disney princess, trust me. Without grabbing any jerky, he marched back over to the counter and started to stare at me. I know staring on its own is harmless, but this stare felt intrusive and made me uncomfortable. His eyes were flying around like ping pong balls and he said, Yeah, that's it. Disney princess. I can see it now. I gave a little half smirk and apparently that wasn't good enough for this man. He started to shout and I mean quite literally started to scream. What? You don't like Disney? I didn't even have time to respond before he started to shout again. My daughter used to like Disney, and now she's just like you. I started to gather that, clearly, this man wasn't right. I had no idea what that statement was even supposed to mean. His daughter is just like me. As calmly as I could, I said, I I'm sorry if I offended you, I'm just... I he cut me off and started to scream uncontrollably. At this point, he wasn't saying anything that made any sense at all. It was just a lot of gibberish and nonsense, saying things like, Instead of a princess, you all want to be the heroes. 
and even more strangely, I could be a king, and instead, I'm here. It was clear to me that this man was having some sort of nervous breakdown. Thankfully, I never hung up the phone with my fiancé who was witnessing this entire unhinged conversation. He felt like something was clearly not right and he didn't want to take any chances, so he called the police and told them what I was dealing with, an unruly and potentially hostile customer. Well, I have never been more thankful for my fiancé because during the man's rant, he did start becoming hostile. He stormed back over to the beef jerky and knocked over the entire display. Even though this guy was clearly not right, this was the first moment that I actually felt unsafe. After knocking over the display, he turned and looked at me and his eyes were almost indescribable. They looked void of any emotion. At that moment, two cop cars pulled up and the man didn't even flinch. He didn't move. He just stood over by the rack and continued to stare at me. The cops walked inside and to their credit they didn't overreact and remained cool and calm. One of the police officers came to me and made sure that I was alright, which I was. The other officer went over to the man and was talking to him quietly. I couldn't make out any of the words the cop was saying to the man. The man looked upset but didn't lose his temper as he did moments ago, and the officers escorted him out, not in handcuffs or anything like that. They literally just walked outside and had a conversation that lasted a good 20 minutes. One officer left with the man, with the other hanging around at the gas station with me and just making sure the man didn't come back. I have no idea what would have happened if my fiancé wasn't still on the phone and called the police. The man was becoming more and more enraged with every moment. I never saw the guy again, and I never placed any official report, really. After this night, I didn't work another overnight shift. I know some people may have had far worse and more terrifying stories of working overnight and... I feel for those people, however, this was the worst thing that's ever happened to me personally and even though I left with no physical harm, the fear that I felt that evening just looking at that crazed man is something that will always be burned into my brain. I was a night shift clerk at a 24 hour gas station back in the late 90s, before they had credit card readers on every pump. I had been doing it for two years already and it was a good job since I went to college during the day. It was tiresome but it paid bills and gave me some spending cash for beer and things like that. The gas station I worked at was on the edge of town, so we got very little traffic late at night, but truckers came through often enough to make it worthwhile to stay open. This suited me well because I would spend all my downtime studying until the next shift came in at 2am. This was probably the only really crazy thing that happened to me while working there, so I remember it well. It was late fall, Friday night I think, and things had been real quiet that night. I'd say that normally we'd get four or five people through every hour or so. But this night, it was an hour until the end of my shift, and I had only seen a trucker and one other late night motorist. As I was saying, it was about one o'clock and all was silent. I was nodding off over my textbooks, or organic chemistry or something like that, when the chime sounded alerting me that someone had walked in. The man looked pretty raggedy. He had a long wool coat on, a beanie, and a salt and pepper beard reached down to his chin. I could tell from 20 feet away that his eyes were bloodshot. They were so red, and the heavy smell of marijuana and booze filled the store as soon as he entered. Like I said before, the store is at the edge of town. I had never had anyone walk in that late at night since it was about 10 miles from any residential area. He staggered up and down each aisle, looking at various products and then putting them back down. I wasn't really nervous, honestly, because he wasn't a very imposing figure, short and really skinny. If anything, I would have expected him to try and grab some food and make a run for it. Once he started to make his way back through the aisles a second time, I asked if he needed some help. He kind of grunted and just kept doing what he was doing. I thought maybe he was just trying to warm up before moving on again and let him be. I went back to reading my book and not even a few minutes later, he was at the checkout stand. It scared me a little because I never heard him walk up to me. He was suddenly there and slurred out, You got any cigarettes? Now there was a whole wall of cigarettes behind me, so I asked him what type. He said, No, no, 
I mean, do you have any on you? I told him I didn't smoke, but if he wanted to purchase some, I could do that for him. This next thing I'll never forget. His face went blank and I could tell he was staring at something behind me, so I turned to see what he was looking at. There was nothing there except the wall and all the cigarettes we had on display. I turned back around and he let out a blood-curdling scream, pointed at something and a look of absolute shock was plastered on his face. You know that scene from Invasion of the Body Snatchers? It's an older film and I'm thinking of the one from 1978, where at the end Donald Sutherland has been turned into a pod person and he's pointing and screaming. I've seen it come back in memes sometimes. Anyways, it kind of reminded me of that, but he looked even more terrified. He then reached over the counter and grabbed me by my shirt, pulling me to him real close and screamed, They're here! They're here! Before pushing me back and running out the door. That scared the shit out of me, and I was hoping it was the last I would see of him. But a minute or two later, he was out in front pacing back and forth, yelling at nothing and occasionally hitting himself in the head with a closed fist. I didn't know what else to do, so I locked the door quickly and watched him for a moment. When it became apparent he wasn't going to leave, I called the cops and let them know he was being a nuisance. They said they would send someone over to pick him up. I couldn't risk him doing something to a customer if one happened to come by, or a customer doing something to this poor man that clearly was not mentally well. From the time I called the cops until they showed up was only about 15 minutes, but in that time, a 90-something Honda Accord pulled up. At first, I worried a customer would be bothered, but then I saw a man, probably in his late 20s. It was hard to tell with the lights washing him out, and he started to talk to the mentally ill man. Then I saw the younger man lead the other one to his car. Before I could unlock the door and make it out of there, they were gone. The police later showed up, and I gave a description of everything that happened, and of the car and the younger man as best I could. I don't know whatever happened to the mentally ill man, or the younger one. I sometimes think that maybe the younger one was the son, friend, or relative of the ill one, and he was taking him somewhere safe. But it could have been something more sinister. About a year ago, in my final semester in college, I worked at a Shaw's grocery store in Boston, Massachusetts. For those of you who don't know what Shaw's is, it's basically a grocery store that's mainly based in the Northeast. I didn't have a car yet, so I mainly requested for day shifts as I've always been skeptical of the night. It wasn't that I hated them. It was more so the fear of what could happen, especially to a petite five foot seven girl like me. However, sometimes I'd be given a closing shift, much to my annoyance, as I had a 7.45 a.m. class and we closed pretty late. Whenever I did have a closing shift, we'd end up closing at 10 and it's about an hour's bus ride back home. My managers, being the jerks that they were, gave me a week of closing shifts knowing my situation. I was pissed, but whatever. It's a few hundred dollars added to my paycheck, so I couldn't argue with that. It was a Thursday night, and I had just finished stocking a few chips as we had just gotten an extra shipment. It was me, my manager, and another coworker running the register. It's about an hour before we close, and the store is pretty much dead except for a few customers. I finish putting the chips on the shelves and get ready to clock out. Before doing so, my manager had told me to go outside and bring the shopping carts that were in the parking lot to the store. Living in a decent sized city, it wasn't uncommon for careless people to leave their carts out in the open. As I'm grabbing a cart beside a car, a woman rolls down her window and says hello. With a friendly smile, I say hello back and asked if I could help her. In the car was a mom and what appeared to be her teenage daughter in the front seat. Right away, the mom seemed concerned, looking back and forth before telling me that they needed gas. 
I tell her there was a gas station just down the road, but she then interrupts me, asking if I could give her money for gas. She's explaining as to how she just came from another state and was in desperate need. Being a dirt poor college student, I barely made enough to pay for my own tuition. However, I didn't want to decline help to someone in need, so I take out my wallet and hand her a $5 bill. She stares down at the money and then back at me as if she wanted more when she said that it wasn't enough. I told her I was sorry and that was all I had. She then says in a more direct tone, if I could get into her car and go down to the gas station to help her get gas. As I was about to respond, that's when I noticed the teenage daughter had been staring at me the whole time. She's sitting in the seat, giving me this dead stare while licking her lips as if she were planning on something. That was my cue to get out of there as something wasn't right. Thankfully, my manager had come out and when he saw the car, it immediately pulled out of the parking lot and drove off. I remember running up to him and thanking him for noticing. He also knew something was wrong as he could definitely see the fear and panic of my face. My manager took a picture of the car and was able to identify the year and model of it. I worked at that Shaw's for a good year after that and never saw that car again. Anybody who has ever worked at a fast food restaurant overnight knows just how unique some patrons can be. To add another variable to this already great combination, I worked at a 24-hour McDonald's that was directly off an exit, so it was a frequent stop for truckers, cops, drunks, and anybody looking to get hot food in the middle of the night. As you would expect, I met countless characters that I could describe. I could write a book about every strange and unique human I met while working at that job. I've even had some wild experiences with people who decided to have an all-out brawl right in the middle of the restaurant, but none of these experiences were scary, just crazy to witness, I guess. Only once in the two years that I worked at the restaurant did I experience something that really indeed horrified me. That night started like most nights that I did the overnight shift. I got there at 10, and it was extremely slow. It was always really slow at that time, and then you would get a rush from about 11.30pm to 1.30am, and then depending on the day, it would be sporadic throughout the night. On this night, I was hoping for a slow night. It was just one of those days when I was not feeling it at all. My car wouldn't start in the morning, and my husband tried to figure it out, but unfortunately, cars aren't his strong suit, so I was without a car. On top of that, I felt so under the weather. It happens to me every fall season. I felt like a house fell on me and I just wanted to get under a blanket and pass out, but unfortunately, I got bills to pay, so unless I was extremely sick, calling in was not an option. Thankfully, I was able to take my husband's Silverado truck to work. A little after 2am, my coworker and I were just hanging out. I ended up getting my wish with it being slow. That night was one of the slowest nights I could remember working. Eventually, my coworker went into the office to do some paperwork. I think that was an excuse to go take a nap or something, but I didn't have the energy to call him out. When I was alone at the counter, listening to YouTube on my phone, I heard the bell from the door. It was a peculiar looking man. He wasn't an old man, but he wasn't young either. Maybe mid-forties if I had to guess. He looked homeless, but not grungy and dirty, more like he was just not put together right. He was shorter than me, but I'm tall for a woman. He couldn't have weighed more than 130 pounds even with his big winter coat on. As he slowly approached the counter, I asked, Hey there, sir. What can I get you tonight? The man just looked at me and smiled. I wish I could have a picture of that moment. The look that he was giving me made me so unsettled. Something about the way he looked at me was just not right, and it gave me the creeps before he even spoke. His eyes were so dark that they looked almost black, and his mouth was just open enough with his smile that I could see his yellow teeth. Finally, he spoke after what seemed like an outrageous amount of time, and I was surprised at the deep southern voice that came out of this little man, and he said, Wow, aren't you gorgeous? I thought I wanted fries, but maybe I'll order something else. Yeah, 
So I know that's weird and creepy, but working this graveyard shift at a restaurant that gets a lot of customers who are under the influence, I'm used to weird attempts at flirting. So I just smiled and said very politely, Okay, sir, well, when you know what you want, just let me know. The man now grinned from ear to ear, flashing his full set of yellow and gray teeth. He set his hands on the counter, and all I could see were his long and dirty fingernails. Trying not to look visibly disgusted, he spoke up again and said, Forget the fries. What time are you done? Usually something like this, I would just smile and say I'm married and move on with my life, but I don't know if it was because I didn't feel good or maybe because the guy gave me the creeps from the start, but instead, in an annoyed and aggressive voice, I responded with, If you don't want to order any food, you can leave. The man started to laugh as if though I told him a great joke. Before I said or did something that I would regret, I turned around and started knocking on the office door. When my coworker opened the door, he could tell that I was visibly shaken. I told him about the creepy guy who was clearly in sight, and he smirked because he knew right away what I was dealing with. He told me to go take a break and that he would take care of the guy. Without even thinking or looking back, I grabbed my coat and went outside, sat in my husband's truck for 15 minutes and just listened to music. I had almost forgotten about that creep up until right before I went back inside. I noticed him wandering on the far side of the parking lot with a to-go bag in his hands. I was relieved that my coworker was able to get rid of him and I decided to wait in the truck for another five minutes just in case. I didn't want this creep to see what vehicle mine was. When I finally got back inside, my coworker looked a little freaked out. I asked him about the interaction with that freak and his answer just really freaked me out. He said in a tentative voice, I don't know if I should tell you. I started to jokingly hit his arm and I told him to tell me, to which he complied and he said, That guy was crazy. When I came out to take his order, he just kept asking where the girl was. So I told him that you went home for the night and he started to lose his mind, screaming and swearing. I ended up just giving him a free medium fry just to shut him up and get him out of here. Then he turned around and as he was walking out, he said, Tell Monica I said goodbye and I'll see her soon. This little story almost made me faint, mainly because I don't wear a name tag at this job. I had no earthly idea how this man knew my name. For the remainder of the shift, I couldn't focus. I just kept looking over at the door expecting this man to stumble back in, but thankfully, he never did. Close to 4.30 in the morning, I asked if I could leave early. He knew that I wasn't feeling well, and with the creepy guy on my mind, he knew that I just needed to get away. Just to make my night more enjoyable, as I was leaving it started to snow, and it was the first truly hard snowfall of the season, even though fall basically just started. I was thankful to have my husband's truck once again, and I figured if I just took it slow I'd be safe. I couldn't have been more wrong. Only about a half mile from work I ended up driving into a ditch because I couldn't see the road from the snow falling. I was alright and it didn't seem like too much damage, but I couldn't get myself out of the ditch. I called police and surprisingly the cops were there in about a minute. I got out of the truck to greet the cop and that's when it happened. From the bed of the truck, the man from the restaurant jumped out and started to run full speed into the night. I screamed and then was at a loss for words. The cop didn't know what to do and started to yell at me to tell him what was going on. I finally told him and he radioed some other cops but they never caught him. We eventually went back to the restaurant and I gave the police my entire story. They looked at the cameras but it wasn't enough to ever actually catch the guy. The worst part was watching the video of the guy getting into the bed of the truck. It was no more than 10 minutes after my break. He came storming back into the parking lot with the food bag still in his hands. He looked around for a few minutes, tried the door and when it was locked, he just jumped into the back. I'm so lucky I drove into a ditch that night because if I hadn't, who knows what would have happened to me. The bag was left in the back of the truck with the fries still in it. This guy never even wanted the food. He knew my name from the start and he knew when I worked and he knew the vehicle that I would have. This happened several years ago and I'm still not quite ready to work overnights again. Always lock your doors and please be careful. Some people really are monsters.
This happened in 2004. I was a new college graduate starting my career in healthcare at a hospital two hours away from where I grew up. The hospital I worked at was huge. A level one trauma center. I work in a highly specialized area. There were only two other people at the hospital with my licensure. That's important because we spent a lot of time working alone in our department and had to stagger our shifts for coverage. I had the early shift. I arrived at 5.45 in the morning. Staff parking was several city blocks away from the hospital, and they sent a shuttle to pick employees up. The lot was surrounded by an urban forest. The city tried to leave as much green space and trees as possible. There was nothing else near the parking lot at the time. Since I arrived so early, the shuttle service had to be called when I arrived. The call button was located at the shuttle stop, meaning you had to leave your car to communicate with the dispatch. I was always creeped out because, even though there were parked cars, there were never any employees in the lot at the time I came in. The overnight shift didn't change until 7 a.m. A few weeks after I started working there, I had settled into the shuttle routine and gotten more comfortable. At this time, cell phone service was spotty at best, and I didn't own a smartphone, so it wasn't very reliable. One afternoon, when I returned to my car, I found a note left on my windshield. It read, Hot and sweet you are. I glanced around and didn't see anyone. I was perplexed, but not really frightened. Another week passed, I forgot about the note, until one afternoon I returned to my car and found a flower in the windshield wiper and another note. This one read, I really love your dimples. I could make you smile. What the heck? I had just moved to this town and didn't have any friends beyond the other two people in my department. I didn't know anyone else. I did feel creeped out this time, and began feeling like I was being watched or something. Early in the mornings I would park as close to the shuttle stop as possible, buzz the dispatch and then wait in my car with the doors locked. I often imagined I heard shuffling noises like shoes scraping through the gravel, and I couldn't see all the way to the dark corners of the lot. When I returned to my car in the afternoons, I carried my pepper spray just in case. I told my coworkers about the notes, and they told me I should tell security. I felt a little silly, but I made a report. Security said they would keep an eye out, whatever that meant. I stopped parking in that lot, opting instead to find parking on the street nearer to the hospital where there were other people around. Things went fine for the next few weeks, until one day I got another note. This time, it was on my car one morning, outside my apartment building. In the same scribbly handwriting, it simply read, Don't be shy. I was so confused. What did this person want? Obviously, they were following me, and now they knew where I lived, and probably knew I lived alone. I contacted the police. There wasn't much they could do but they did make some safety recommendations and said they would patrol the neighborhood more often. I took a self-defense class and was hyper-aware of my surroundings. It was worse not knowing who I was dealing with. A few weeks later, a woman was found assaulted and murdered in the trees behind the employee parking lot. They caught the guy a couple days later. I recognized him. He was a contract painter who had been working in my area. The hospital had been remodeling our department, and this painter would come in early, around 6.30 a.m. I made coffee every morning in the break room, and he would come in to get a cup. We made small talk a few times, but never any red flags. Then it came back to me. Sometimes he would call me Dimples. I shivered. Good morning, Dimples. I was shocked that he had literally been right under my nose for weeks. 
I had been totally alone with him on many occasions, and I never suspected anything. I don't know for certain that he was the one leaving the notes, but they stopped after he was arrested. Anyway, stay safe out there, guys and gals. Like everyone else, the last few years have been hard. In early 2020, I lost my grandma to pneumonia, and it wouldn't be long before my aunt got sick too and came very close to death herself. It was a lot for a guy my age to handle, but I knew once it was over, I'd be able to see my Faith again. Now Faith and I had met in middle school and quickly fell in love. Our homes were too far apart to see one another very often. Her parents were also super traditional and didn't want her having a boyfriend. Besides school, our only constant form of contact was the telephone. We'd often talk all night and go straight into school without a second of sleep. And in spite of all the odds, we stayed together. The biggest test of our relationship would be high school. Faith's dad bought a new house even further away. That put Faith into a different school district. Now we would see each other even less. And I was sure this meant the end of our relationship. But Faith refused to give up. By now, we both had computers in our rooms, and we were able to talk and see each other over the internet with webcams. Every day, we'd race home from school and talk until early into the next morning. I'd do all my homework during school time so it wouldn't get in the way. Faith did the same, and for the next three or so years, this would be our prime avenue of communication. I think we were only able to meet face to face a handful of times, and it was hard on both of us. I lost hope more than once, but Faith always lived up to her name and brought me back from the edges of darkness every time. Strangely, despite all the personal sadness that I experienced during the height of the pandemic, Faith and I thrived. Being quarantined worked great for our particular situation. Other than a few hours of school garbage every day, we got to talk uninterrupted all day and night. Even so, not seeing her in person for so long weighed on me. I was doubting our future together as I had so many times before. Luckily by then the lockdowns had lifted. Her father would be returning to work but school remained online. This was the perfect chance for us to be alone together and I was going to take it. I brought this up with my brother and he agreed to loan me his car to go see her. A week later our opportunity arrived. I drove the 35 miles to her house. She rushed me inside and closed the door and we held one another tightly for a long time. The energy was a bit weird between us, but we overcame it pretty quickly. We rushed off to her room for a little personal time, and I'd forgotten how great being with her was. Unfortunately, our time together was about to be cut short. I had just left her room. Faith was making us a snack when her dad walked in, and he began yelling at me instantly. Things like, where is my daughter? What did you do to my little girl? Faith ran into the room and tried to calm him down, and it didn't help. In his defense, he'd never actually met me. Crazy, I know, considering we'd been together for so long, but our relationship hadn't exactly been normal. We tried to explain the situation, but her dad was just too angry to listen. He looked at Faith and I real closely and sneered, and this would be the point when everything came off the rails. What have you two been up to? His expression was so terrifying I didn't dare speak, and he looked back and forth at each of us, but we stayed quiet. Answer me now. Did you put hands on my little girl? I remember him saying. Now Faith's dad looked at her and asked her if I'd force myself on her. And she, acting instinctively, blurted out, No. We loved each other, and we'd been together since seventh grade. He knew what that meant, and I knew exactly what his expression meant. He gritted his teeth and lunged at me, and he was too fast for me. I was overwhelmed by his size and power and he grabbed me around the throat with one hand and lifted me off the ground. I was barely able to breathe or swallow. I tried to speak, but he told me to shut up and listen. I don't care if you two met in kindergarten. You're going to leave here this second and never contact my little girl again. If I ever see you here again, I won't hesitate to kill you. And with that, he let me drop to the floor and shouted at the top of his lungs to get out. He didn't have to repeat himself. I was already out the door before he finished yelling. I started the car and sped away. I was already several miles down the road before I slowed down. 
I was shaking so badly I could barely keep hold of the wheel. The notifications were going off on my phone, but I didn't care. Odds were high that it was Faith, and I was way too shaken to talk to anyone, especially her. Now back at home, I locked myself in my room and tried to calm down. A few hours passed before I got the courage to check my phone, and just as I suspected, Faith had texted and called me at least five times since I'd left. I wasn't sure what to do. I talked to my brother about it, and he suggested that I sleep on it before deciding. It was hard, but I did get to sleep at around 3 a.m. When I awoke the next morning, my mind wasn't any clearer. In fact, now that I had time to rest, I was even more traumatized by what had occurred. I couldn't get Faith's dad's angry face out of my head. I honestly believed that he really would kill me if I gave him the chance. I remain in this cycle of indecision to this day. It's almost been three years since I've communicated with Faith, and I'm still unsure if I ever will. She still sends me texts from time to time, and I read them. It's hard to be out of contact after all the years we've been together, but as long as she lives at home, I'm not willing to risk my life for my family's. I looked into the eyes of evil that day, and I'll never forget it. Faith, if you do hear this or read this, I love you, and always will. But your father's a monster. I suggest you get away from him as soon as possible. And until then, we'll be doomed to be apart. One heart, forever broken in two. I was around 15 when my dad got a job with the railroad. Now before then, he was an over-the-road truck driver. This job kept him away from home during the week, and mom and I were lonely a lot, but the money was just too good to turn down. The two of us got used to dealing with things on our own. I learned to cook and do my own laundry during this time. This skill would serve me well later. Neither of my roommates in my first apartment had any clue how to do really anything, and it would be an eye-opening experience and made me appreciate my mom that much more. Maybe we can discuss that sometime later, though. Today, I want to tell everyone about something that happened to me during that time of learning. This was when I was about 12. I woke up for school as usual, but quickly realized that I was sick. Now, to keep this PG rated, I had stuff spewing out of both ends, if you get my meaning. I tried to be an adult about it, but I fainted in front of my mom and she put me to bed. Although not ideal, I was happy to have the day off from school. I was given a bunch of different medications and quickly passed out. I woke up once or twice to go to the bathroom, but I slept for most of the day otherwise. And just after 2 p.m., though, I awoke refreshed and feeling great. The sick feeling was completely gone, but now I was starving. My first instinct was to run into the kitchen and gorge myself. I decided that that was probably a bad idea. Instead, I took a page from my mom's book and tried some saltines. I'd had good luck with those in the past, and I also grabbed a Sprite while I was there and brought them back to my room. I was close to the bathroom if things went wrong. I had 9 or 10 crackers and half a glass of Sprite, and I waited 30 minutes to see if I'd barf them up. Nothing bad happened, but now I was even hungrier. I thought for a minute before choosing ramen as the safest option. I finished off the bottle of Sprite and made for the kitchen. My mom would be home soon, and under normal circumstances... I would have just waited for her to arrive, but I was so ravenous I couldn't wait any longer. I made ramen for myself several times. I filled the pot and eagerly watched in hopes that the water would boil quicker. It didn't. When the moment finally arrived, I broke up the noodles and added them to the water. A minute later, I poured the flavor packet in. I impatiently stirred until the noodles softened just enough to be edible. I was done waiting. Now the events that followed were likely due to dehydration and overall weakness. I looked around for a pot holder but saw none. There was a hand towel nearby though so I grabbed for that. And the premise was the same. I couldn't see any problems. However, today was not a usual day. I lifted the pot and set it on the counter like I normally do. As I set the towel aside, I realized that it was on fire. I snatched it back up and tossed it into the sink behind me. My hand was slightly burned in the process. The time I wasted worrying about my hand allowed the fire enough time to jump onto the curtains. From this point, I was always a step behind. The water from the faucet extinguished the flames quickly. My split second of satisfaction was destroyed once I noticed the burning curtains above the sink. 
Having one of those sprayers in my sink would have been perfect for this, but we didn't have one. I attempted to splash water from my hands. It was useless, though. The curtains were already consumed, and the fire had now taken hold on the ceiling in the adjoining cabinet. I was so overwhelmed and incapable of coming up with any remedy now. When the fire alarm went off, I gave up and ran out of the house. I opened the front door and ran directly into my mother. She was very calm, and all I could say was fire, kitchen. She didn't miss a step after that. To my amazement, she entered the kitchen and opened the door under the sink. Flames were covering the ceiling now. A few came unnervingly close to her, and like a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat, she withdrew a massive fire extinguisher from under the sink and pointed it at the ceiling, and within seconds, most of the flames on the ceiling were gone. From there, she backtracked to the cabinets and put the flames there out. If I had to guess, I'd say she had the fire completely extinguished in less than 30 seconds. It remains the single most amazing thing I've seen to this day. Mom ran over to check on me. It took a few seconds for me to regain my senses, but once I did, I broke down and cried. I was so relieved I couldn't speak. My mom got out the first aid kit and put some cream on my hands, and the weight of my actions began to dawn on me. I started apologizing over and over, and this made me cry again. Mom calmed me down and assured me that it wasn't a big deal. I couldn't see how it wasn't, but I'd have to rely on her judgment. Some time passed and we discussed what had happened. I expected her to scream at me any second, but she never did. After the excitement had passed, we walked into the kitchen to get a look at the damage. I sheepishly asked her what was going to happen, and her answer caught me completely off guard. Don't worry about it. I, I only care that you're safe. I'll tell your dad it's my fault. He may grumble a little, but what's done is done. I could feel the weight lift off my shoulders in real time. Rather than cry like I wanted to do, I grabbed my mother as tight as possible and held her for a long time. And that's basically how everything occurred that day. After our little family moment ended, Mom and I cleaned up as much as we could. There wasn't really a lot we could do at the time. Dad would have to replace the cabinet before the painting was done. I recall that he wasn't as upset as we had expected. He simply asked if Mom and I were okay and let out a big sigh. A few weeks later, he came home with the cabinet and some cans of paint, and by the following week, the kitchen was looking as good as new. I'm still amazed at how quickly things can go from life-threatening to no big deal. Life's just kind of funny like that. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Before I continue with this next part, I want to go ahead and say that I deeply regret doing the things I did when I was younger, and I don't condone breaking the law or doing the kind of things that I did back then. But anyways, I used to break into people's houses or garages, and I would steal whatever I could find for food money, or really whatever I wanted to spend it on. I should also mention that I lived in a very bad part of Nashville, by the way, but I would stay with my grandparents, who had custody of my older brother on the weekends. Well, this particular weekend, when I was about 13, I was going through some people's backyards looking for unlocked cars or garages. Well, I happened to notice a back door was open, about 4 or 5 inches with no lights on anywhere downstairs. So, being the 13-year-old kid that I was, I go into the house and while tiptoeing through the house trying to steal stuff like TVs and game systems, as well as computers, I heard a high-pitched scream, but it was muffled, if you can understand what I'm saying. Well, that stopped me dead in my tracks and caused me to listen way more intently. After the muffled scream, I had heard a slap and what sounded like someone then telling them, Don't bother screaming, because nobody can hear you screaming down here. So I slowly start walking towards the screams, and I found a door cracked open that led to the basement, and I could tell there was a light on in the basement. I end up laying on the floor and looking down the steps towards the center of the basement, and I see that a man and a woman are tied up to some chairs in the basement, and both are gagged. The difference was that the man had his head hanging limp, and he had blood all over his chest, and he didn't even look like he was breathing. 
when I saw this, I got really scared, and then I took off running, making all kinds of noise. I know that it was loud enough for the intruder downstairs to hear me and freak out and start running up after me, but I just ran as fast as possible out the front door. I didn't even bother unlocking the screen door. I just ran right through it and ran down to the corner house, who I knew the owner was a firefighter. I start beating on his door, screaming for help, that there's a man chasing me trying to kill me like he did the neighbor. Well, this really freaked out the homeowner, and it caused him to pull out a weapon on me first until he noticed the deranged man running behind me at full speed, who had a machete in one hand and a kitchen knife in the other. Without saying a word, the fireman opened fire and he shot the guy in his leg, which caused him to fall and it also caused the kitchen knife to go right through his own neck. I believe that actually killed him on sight. I never heard him make any noises, but I was making enough for myself at the moment. The fireman called the police before heading towards the neighbor's house that the man came from, and he then found the wife barely clinging to her own life. But unfortunately, the husband was pronounced dead on the scene. What I heard around the neighborhood afterwards was that the husband had been in a car accident about six months before this, and the said crazy man's wife had apparently died in that car wreck. This caused the man to go crazy and start drinking and doing drugs until he just didn't care about living and he just wanted everyone to suffer like he and his wife had. So he went to the man's house and he tortured him and his wife for hours until he passed out from the pain. The intruder slit the husband's throat and before chasing me, he slit the wife's throat as well. But luckily, the paramedics were able to save her when they arrived. So yeah, kids, don't break into other people's homes. You just might stumble onto something that you can't get out of. I'm a 19 year old female, but this happened when I was 14. My family went to my aunt and uncle's house for some reason. I didn't want to go, so my parents let me stay home by myself. They said they were only going to be gone for a few hours, but at about 10 p.m., my dad called me. Hey Ashlyn, we're going to be staying the night at your aunt and uncle's place. I love you. Good night. I didn't even have time to say anything before I hung up on the phone. I got frustrated because I didn't feel comfortable staying home alone then. I started to boil some water and make some ramen. When I was about to put the ramen in the water, I had heard the doorbell ring. I went to go look out the window and the door, but no one was there. For some context, the window has one of those half circle ones at the top of the door. Anyway. I went back to tending the ramen when the doorbell rang again. I went to look again, but there was still no one there. My ramen was now done by this point, and I went to go sit on the couch to eat it. Once I was done and about to put the bowl in the sink, I had heard one of the basement windows then break. It was one of those windows that were very small and close to the ground. I just ran to my room at that point and I locked the door. After like 10 minutes, I slowly opened the door, and there was nothing there. I went over to the basement door, which was right down the hall. I gathered all the courage to open up the door. It was really so dark down there, so I'd flick the light above the stairs on. But what I saw next was absolutely disturbing. On the bottom step, there was a man there. He looked to be homeless. He was extremely skinny, like he hadn't even eaten in weeks. He was also smiling from ear to ear, holding a knife to his side. I just slammed the door and ran back to my room. I had a bit of a problem here. I left my phone on the coffee table in the living room, so I couldn't call the police. I then heard the basement door open. I just dove under my bed as I heard his footsteps getting closer. I heard my doorknob start to jiggle and shake. Then, I heard a small maniacal laugh. I got out from under the bed and started to open the window, and he then started banging on the door. I got the window open and jumped out. I ran to my neighbor's house, and they let me in to call the police. They arrived in five minutes and searched the house, while another cop started talking to me about the incident. 
They eventually found the man, and they brought him out in cuffs. They told me they found him hiding in my closet. I was terrified at this. I went in to grab some essentials, and I asked them to take me to my aunt and uncle's house. They did, and once we got there, I then told my parents everything that happened. It made me so scared to think that he was waiting for me to come back. I developed severe paranoia, and I had to start going to therapy in 2019 for this. Luckily, I'm doing better now. And last I heard about the man, he was still locked up. Probably for something else. I was told he's going to be sent to a mental facility on July 21st, 2022. And I really do hope that he gets the help he needs. This happened about three weeks ago. It was roughly about 3.30 in the morning, and I was watching some YouTube videos. I saw my dog's ears perk up, and he walked to the back door. I figured he needed to use the restroom, so I went to let him out. When I made it over to the door, I unlocked it, and I was about to open the door, when something then told me to click the light on first. When I did so, I then saw something quickly flash behind the side of my house. I felt uneasy, but I opened the door and let the dog out. He immediately bolted to the side that I saw the flash, and then disappeared into the dark. I then grabbed my dad's 12-gauge shotgun that we keep hidden by the back door for emergencies. I grabbed my spotlight and looked around, but I couldn't really see from the porch. I closed the door and I stepped off the porch, calling my dog's name. Eventually, he came running back to me, and I took him back into the house. But when I reached the door, I saw that it was cracked open. This frightened me, mostly because I was alone for the weekend, and I know I closed the door. As I approached the back door, gun in hand, I saw a light moving around in my house. I put my dog on his chain, and then slowly moved into the house. When I got into the room where the light was coming from, which was my sister's room, I slowly and quietly nudged the door open with my barrel. And when I turned on the light, I saw a large man wielding one of my knives from my bedroom. I told the man to drop the knife and get the fuck out of my house before I shoot him. He promptly dropped my knife and he then proceeded to jump out of my sister's window like this was some kind of action movie or something. I fired three shots into the air as he ran away. I don't know who this man was or what he had planned, but whoever he was, if he happens to return, the next time, there will not be a warning. Hi, my name is Andrews, and I live in southern India. This just happened to me a couple of nights ago, and it's still really fresh in my mind. It was 30 minutes past 11 p.m., I believe. I was lying in my bed listening to Southern Cannibal to go to sleep, since I have amnesia, and imagining stories by listening to them makes me sleep much faster. Suddenly, I saw a beam of torchlight entering through my window from the back of my bed. At first, I thought it was just the security guard who guards my little secluded village, but that beam of light was persistent. This went on for three more minutes or so, with every window passing a considerable amount of torchlight to see as well. After the final window in my house passed a light, it was, well, gone. I thought it was strange, but I kept listening to the stories. After a while, I had heard the sounds of footsteps approaching my door, since I was now in the hall trying to sleep on the couch. I paused the story, and I had then looked out through a large vertical window facing the outside of my house. I dropped my AirPods case in shock, as I then saw a man wearing a kerchief around his mouth trying to do something with the lock. I then heard the sound of my lock turning. Stupidly, I hid under my couch to call 100, which is the number to call the police in India. The man then entered my house and started looking around the house. The operator then said that it would take the police from the nearest police outpost at least 10 minutes minimum to arrive in my house. He went into my bedroom, taking all the money I had as a broke college student, 
as I later found out after the cops arrived. He went around looking in the kitchen, and he actually took a piece of cake from the fridge, which I bought for my birthday. After that, he just left. I didn't go out to check if he had gone yet, because I saw him holding some sort of weapon, which I believe was a pipe. After what felt like an hour, but only five minutes, the cops arrived. The policeman arrived and announced their presence. I yelled from behind the couch, telling him that I was the one who called them. I then came out and they questioned me. What they said next sent chills down my spine. An old man who lived a couple houses down from the neighborhood actually called the cops saying the same thing as I did. There was one key difference between him and me though. He was dead and I was alive. He was apparently bludgeoned with the supposed pipe that the thief was holding and there was blood everywhere. The thief must have inspected the windows to see if anyone was in my home, and I guess after checking it out, he thought that no one was home and broke in. Needless to say, I didn't get any sleep that night, and I also got nightmares for the next few days, thinking of what would have happened if I hadn't paid attention to the lights and I was still in my bed, or if I was listening to those stories with high volume. The police said they'd look into the case more and keep me updated. To this day, I've received no updates, and I'm still very afraid that that murderous psycho of a thief is still out there. I know everybody says this, and it's very cliche, but stay safe out there. Always lock your doors and windows. Back in September, I moved out of my parents' place and into my own new townhouse. It wasn't anything extravagant, but it was mine, and it immediately started feeling like home. I live in a quiet neighborhood where basically there's no crime, and everyone keeps to themselves. At the time this story took place, I lived completely alone. I wasn't really sure what to make of it, and I still have more questions than answers. Everything was going really great in my new place for about a week. That was until one night, at about 3 a.m., I was home alone asleep when I then awoke to the sound of my doorbell ringing. I thought for a moment that I might have just dreamed it, but my fears were confirmed when I then heard the doorbell chime once again. Surely no one ringing my doorbell at 3 a.m. had good intentions. My bedroom is on the second floor and looks straight down to the front steps. I sat, trying to will up enough courage to look outside. I eventually felt confident enough to look, but to my surprise, there was no one there. I honestly wasn't sure whether this made things better or if it just made the whole thing even more unnerving. I eventually calmed down and then slept for the rest of the night. I later on checked outside in the morning but I didn't see anything. I went on with my day and just forgot about the whole thing. Fast forward a few weeks and the same thing happens again. Once again at around 3 a.m. A feeling of dread filled my body as I sat bolt upright in bed. I could feel my own heart beating in my throat. I cautiously peered through my curtains. And again, no one was there. This was just not making any sense. My doorbell never rang on its own during the day, and it was way too high for any animal to reach it. This occurred several more times in the coming weeks. It was always in the middle of the night around 3 a.m., as though it were planned. One day, though, it just stopped altogether, and it hasn't happened again. I am relieved that this eerie and unnerving incident no longer occurs but I still often wonder why this happened. Had it not always happened around the same time, it might have had a better explanation, but I have no good reason for why this happened. This has since stopped though, and I'm thankful. I'll be sure to provide an update if anything starts to happen again. This happened back when I'd been out of the dating game for about a year or so, and being a painfully awkward person who doesn't really get out much, my best friend had convinced me to try online dating. I thought it was a good idea at the time, 
so I ended up signing up to that OkCupid website. I could just chat with people for a while, get to know them, then I could work out who was creepy and who was not, then just hit up whoever was the best match. So I meet this guy on the site and we spend a few weeks chatting and getting to know each other. He actually seemed really cool and chill, kind of quirky, but not nearly as red flag waving weird as some of the other guys I'd talked to. When the time was just right, he asked me on a date, and by that point I was quite excited about meeting him, so I said, sure, why not? I told the guy that I preferred simple, low profile dates, so he suggested that I go over to his place so he could make us some dinner, and after that we could watch some indie horror films, which was something we were both into. I told my friend about this, the same one who suggested online dating, and we discussed some of the risks of just going over to his place instead of meeting in a public place first. I get that it's a real roll of the dice doing that kind of thing, but there was the minor detail of me being 6'2 and him being 5'7. I know that's hardly a major height difference, and it didn't bother me that he was shorter, especially when it meant that he probably wouldn't be able to straight up overpower me if anything went wrong with the date. Plus, I gotta admit to being a real sucker for a guy that can cook, so that definitely clouded my judgement in many respects. That being said, when I showed up to his place, me and my friend had developed a code word system that we could use through text or calls and she had all the details of where I was, so if I got there and things just didn't feel right, I could call her or text her, drop the emergency code word, and she'd think of a reason for me to leave and then come pick me up. Anyway, as I said, I arrived and we got up to his apartment so he can show me around. He started emphasizing his bedroom a little too much, commented on how his big bed would fit me, but I just put that down to some awkward bad taste jokes and got him to move on. After that, he then takes me to the kitchen, where I assumed that he was about to try and claw some points back by actually cooking me dinner. He talked about what a good cook he was and how he was going to wow me with his cooking skills, but when it came to it, he hadn't actually bought anything to cook at all. All he bought for our date was this bottle of red wine and he claimed that it was super expensive, I guess. I made the mistake of showing up on an empty stomach, thinking that he was actually going to cook for me, so when I found out that I wasn't about to be fed, I was very disappointed and actually kind of angry too. But then, instead of understanding why I'd been so annoyed, the guy kept emphasizing the bottle, telling me how he'd spent like a hundred something bucks on it, and that I should be more grateful that I actually dug deep into his pockets to buy us something like that. Don't get me wrong, I like wine, but I don't know wine, so to me that thing could have been the rarest bottle in existence or the cheapest crap from the crummiest liquor store, and I've never have known it. So instead of having dinner, we ended up talking over this bottle of wine, which I'll admit was pretty good, but not something I'd ever pay hundreds for. The first actual red flag I noticed was when it became blatantly obvious that he was trying to get me wasted. There came a point where if I took so much as a sip from my drink, he'd be all like, want to top off? And pour even more wine into my glass. That combined with the not making any kind of dinner at all, and I started to get very uncomfortable. I still figured that he was just trying to be romantic or whatever, and that he was just dumb as opposed to malicious or predatory. So, after pretty much forcing him to let me eat the remains of a bag of chips and some toast, I felt together enough to just carry on with the date and see where things went. I mean, he was also drinking pretty heavily, and I always figured those kind of guys would like pretend to drink or something just to make their date drink more, but he was chugging that wine down like a trooper, so... I just slowed my sips until all the wine was gone, then we headed to the couch for some movies. Anyway, we sit on the couch and I ask what movie he'd pick for us to watch. He'd already picked something out and was keeping it a surprise until I got there and had teased me with a selection all day like, you're gonna love this movie, it's so hardcore, so underrated, stuff like that. Gotta admit too, I was actually pretty stoked to find out what he'd picked, as I knew that he had good taste and we shared a lot of favorite indie horror movies but then instead of some hidden gem I'd never heard of, something I could actually take an interest in, something that might salvage what had been a pretty crappy date so far, he pulls out a Serbian film. Now for those that don't know, a Serbian film basically bills itself as the most graphically gruesome and disturbing movie of all time. 
I know some people are really into it and can talk for days about all the metaphors, hidden meanings, and theories surrounding it, but me personally, I hate it. It's just an increasingly violent but meaningless mix of gore in adult movies that has zero value past shock. So when he suggested we put it on, I very politely asked if he had anything else in mind because I had already seen a Serbian film and I wasn't all that excited about watching it again, obviously. But nope, he insists we watch it, picking up on the fact that I wasn't into it and then trying to tell me that the only reason I didn't like it was because I didn't understand it. I pretty much decided there and then that this guy wasn't getting a second date, and as much as I was mad at how patronizing he was, I just kept my cool and got my phone out to text my friend our emergency code word so she could end the date. As soon as I got my phone out and started typing, the guy is like vocally irritated when he says, who are you texting? His tone and attitude once again affirmed why he wouldn't be getting a second shot at this, but again, I just kept my cool and replied, just letting a friend know I'll be home late tonight. This is something me and my friend had already planned out and it worked like a charm. The guy totally thought that he was in the clear and calmed back down again on the assumption that I was going to give him some or whatever. Then a few minutes later, my girl comes through with the call and puts on an Oscar winning performance that there had been a break in at our apartment, we lived separately. The call volume was loud enough that the guy could hear and all I had to do was act naturally and sell the bit. My friend then asks if I need a ride from somewhere and I tell her this guy's whole address down to the zip code just to subtly let him know that someone knew where I was. I thought I was going to be out of there in maybe 10 to 15 minutes, but then my friend tells me how she had to drive her little sister somewhere and that she was 40 something minutes away. I was livid. It turned out that she had to run an errand for her mom whose car was in the shop, so I guess it was just bad luck more than her not sticking to the plan. But still, I was pretty horrified to think that I'd have to sit through 40 more minutes of such a gross film with a guy that had gotten way weirder and creepier as he'd gotten drunker. For the next 30 minutes, I had to sit through the guy giving me this whole thesis on why a Serbian film is the best indie horror movie since The Blair Witch Project, and that the reason it's so horrible is because it's a mirror which reflects a decaying society or some nonsense. As the minutes tick by, increasingly weird and gruesome things are happening, but basically, there comes a point when something super gross is happening and a kid is involved, I'll just say that. I don't want to tell you exactly what happens in the movie, less because of spoilers and more because it's so disgusting that I don't want to type it out, but it gets to this really bad part of the movie, and the guy next to me starts breathing super heavy and loud through his nostrils. He'd also insisted on turning the lights off, by the way, which admittedly I did agree to. But then picture the sound of heavy breathing right next to you in a dark room, and you understand how creeped out I was. I gave my head the tiniest little turn, straining my eyes to see what he was doing, and saw him just staring at the screen. First time he'd been quiet for pretty much the whole movie. I then actually turned to face him to say, You good, dude? and after giving me this weird little groan of, uh, huh, actually scoops up the couch a little to be closer to me, like so close our hips are touching. I tell him, whoa there, buddy, way too early for that move. But he just sort of whines again and replies, why not? Thankfully, it really was coming close to pick up time, so I could use that as an excuse as to why we couldn't start doing anything. But then he saw it the exact opposite way, because I was leaving soon, he felt all entitled to getting a little something. Two waves of grossness hit me, one after the other. The first was how poorly he timed his little move on me, coupled with the actual physical contact. Both made my skin crawl, but the second wave of grossness hit me way harder because that's when I considered what had actually prompted his little finesse attempt. He'd been staring super intently into some of the grossest, most obscene stuff I'd ever seen on film, and that's what had him wanting to make out. I cannot overstate how completely creeped out I was. I remember recoiling a little, but then he tried to put his hand on my thigh and then that was it. I was out of there. I didn't care if I have to wait in the street outside, I was not spending another minute in this creepy handsy guy's dark apartment. I grabbed my purse, stood up, and told him, 
I'm sorry. I have to go. After that, I just marched towards the apartment front door and hoped that he wouldn't try and make a scene in the hallway. He didn't actually follow me outside, which I'm grateful for, honestly. But somehow what he did was way, way worse in terms of how terrifying it was. Picture me walking down the apartment's hallway, almost total darkness, praying that he wasn't about to run up behind me to kill me. And then all I hear in the dark is this screech, and I mean screech of, You're not leaving! I just zoomed for the door, somehow got it open after panicking that the guy had locked it somehow, then bolted downstairs and out of the apartment building. I kept thinking that he'd follow me with a frickin' knife or a baseball bat or something, and although he didn't, that fear was constantly with me as I power walked up the street, looking over my shoulder every few seconds to make sure that I was still alone. I then gave my friend a call and told her to hurry up, and thankfully she was only a minute or two away, so I was out of the neighborhood and finally safe from the guy, or at least in my mind I was safe from him since I didn't know his neighborhood very well. The whole car ride back I was telling my friend how a weak start to the date had just descended into this total nightmare and the whole time she's cringing so hard until I got to the part about that scene of the movie and how he'd reacted to it. And that's when she started getting scared for me, laying on apologies about taking so long to get to me. Obviously I forgave her, it wasn't her fault that her mom had a car emergency but I was still pretty shaken up after having to wait there for so long. I ended up blocking the guy's number before he could try to get in touch with me again, but after a few days of the incident being on my mind, I decided it wasn't enough to just cut him out of my life. He might not have hurt me that night, he might not even try to, but something told me that it was just a matter of time before that guy did something that couldn't be fixed by just a pint of gelato and some girl talk. I know it's not illegal to go on a bad date with anyone, and I know this might make me sound like a total Karen in many ways, but I ended up calling the cops just to tell them what had happened. They agreed that it wasn't illegal to be bad at dating, and I knew trying to pursue assault over his thigh touch thing would just be pointless. But the cops were cool in that they said that they keep his name on file just in case anything came up in the future, and they actually thanked me for letting them know too. That made me feel like I might have actually done something to prevent anything really bad from happening in the future, and part of me hopes the cops went over to warn him, but maybe that's just wishful thinking on my part. What I do know is how that experience totally warned me off of online dating for a few years, and it wasn't until Bumble came out that I actually started dipping my toes back into the water. I know, I wasn't hurt and I can say that in a world where so many young women's lives are snatched away by violent men, what happened that night still terrified me, and I'd never have guessed that the guy was like that from our few weeks of talking online. But number one thing I learned from it, always, always meet in a public place that you know well for a first date, and always have an escape plan. This took place in the late 1990s, not too long after I graduated high school. A little backstory first. I met this guy when I was about 14 or 15. He was older than me. I never really knew his age since he often lied to me about it, but he was at least a few years older than me. He became my off and on summer fling slash romance for a few years. Nothing really serious. When I was a senior in high school, we connected during the winter one night, and he asked me to be his girlfriend. I did like him a lot, so we started dating full time. He was sweet. I missed most of the red flags, like him worrying about all the other guys in class noticing me if I wore a dress or something. Right after my 18th birthday, we moved in together. I was still in high school, and I had an after school job so I thought I could handle it. Plus, I thought it would be a helpful life partner and we could get a life together. I was wrong. I graduated high school and ended up getting two jobs, and he would keep quitting any job he had. 
I was also preparing to go to a local college. I was determined to do it all, though. After about a year of this, and some really crazy fights that became physical, I ended up just becoming numb to the life I was living now. I say physical, but the truth is, he was physically abusive. Between the physical and mental abuse and torture, he wore me down. I knew I deserved better. I knew he was lying every single time he told me that he would never hurt me again. I also believed him when he told me he would kill me and think nothing of it. I won't tell every single time he beat me, but one of the times I truly thought he was going to murder me. I had been at home with our baby boy while he was out with friends or whatever he was doing. It was a pretty good night. I enjoyed being a new mom, and I'd like the time away from the guy. It was relaxing. I'll refer to him as Asshole. Well, Asshole came home later this winter night, and he had brought a friend with him. I knew the friend, but not too well. They came in the house, and everything seemed to be going okay. But I noticed that Asshole was being a little sarcastic with his tone towards me. It was a fake nice and sarcasm that usually came before he wanted to start a fight. I then prepared for him to start arguing. I thought that his friend being there would be a safety net of some sort. Boy, was I wrong. I made sure not to do anything to make him mad. I stayed close to my little boy and let him and his friend just hang out, talk, and drink and whatever they were doing. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what caused him to snap that night, but he did. It was the worst I had ever seen him. He wanted to fight me. He screamed in my face that he was going to beat me like a man, all while I was holding our baby. His friend followed him, or at least not standing too far away from him. I tried to run, but he blocked me before I could get away. He told me he was going to kill me. I saw his friend just standing there, panicked. I handed him my baby and then said, please don't let anything happen to him. The moment my baby was in his friend's arms, I felt my hair being ripped out of my head. Asshole began kicking and hitting me. I got away long enough to make it to the living room where our landline phone was. I dialed 911 and right as I hit the third, he picked me up and then slammed me down on the ground. He slammed the phone down to hang it up and then cracked me on the face with it. I thought for sure that that 911 call didn't go through. He began hitting me so hard and choking me that I was blacking out and seeing stars as my head spun like crazy. I looked at his friend and I begged him to go get help. He just stood there, scared to death. Asshole then told him if he did, he would kill him. I understood in that moment that his friend was truly just as scared and didn't know what to do. I wasn't mad at him for not helping. I was just really thankful that he was protecting my baby. I knew this was going to be it. Asshole was going to kill me like he often said he would. He would have no remorse just as he promised. I wasn't about to make this easy on asshole. I fought back, harder than I'd ever fought back before. He was on something, which I later found out, so his strength was definitely not something that I could match. Not to mention he was about 100 pounds bigger than me, but I was a mom who wanted to live to see my baby grow up. As he hovered over me, hitting me in the head and choking me, I grabbed his balls and twisted and pulled. It didn't phase him, he was so high. I was tasting blood and feeling so numb. He was beating me so bad that I wasn't even hurting anymore. Maybe it was the adrenaline in the moment. I don't know. But suddenly, the hit stopped. I no longer felt my head getting bashed in. But weirdly enough, I heard a pounding. He got off of me, and for a split second, I didn't know what was happening. I wasn't even sure if I was still alive at this point. Finally, I stood up as he told me to be quiet. The pounding was the police knocking on our door. The 911 call had been an open call, and the entire fight was heard. Asshole answered the door, and he told me to stay back. He started to tell the police some story about the baby just crying. I stepped in the view of the officer who looked at me, and he immediately threw Asshole against the outside of our home. 
the rest seemed to happen so fast. Asshole was being arrested, and an officer was talking to me and taking my statement. One of the cops told me that I had one of the worst injuries he had ever seen a person have and still be alive. Asshole had hurt me so badly that he had beat a hole into my lip where I couldn't even have a drink without the water going through. He called me from jail, and the exact words he said to me was, Why did you do this? He really wasn't even sorry at all. He didn't even lie to me this time and pretend that he was. I left him. He was eventually sentenced to 26 days in jail. He never served them because he moved to another state before he could be arrested. He managed to find me and stalk me, but I'd stayed strong and stayed away from him. Eventually, he had moved on to his next target. I have truly felt so much guilt over this, but the next woman was beaten and choked too. But she wasn't just beaten, she was also choked to her death. He took the life of someone, and I'm sure he thought nothing of it, just as he always said to me. I know deep in my heart that if I hadn't walked away, it would have been me he killed, but I'm so sorry to that woman's family. He's in prison now, probably feeling no remorse at all, but hopefully he's getting justice served to him in other ways. I'm just so glad that I actually got away from him. I'm a cow farmer in the Midwest. It's not the best work, but it is work, and with how hard it is to find a job with decent pay these days, I've learned to appreciate it. The job entails cleaning up after the cows, checking their hooves, milking, and helping them give birth when necessary. It's a pretty messy job when you look at it from the outside, but i gotten pretty used to it. I don't even smell the stink anymore like I did when I first started. It used to be almost unbearable, but now, really nothing. The farm was my father's before me and his father's before him. And the story I'm about to tell you is my dad's. He told it to me back when I first started the job as almost uh, what not to do when tending to the animals and working on the farm. He's long past now, God rest his soul, but this story has haunted me for years, so I figured I'd let other people hear it and judge it for themselves. This is back in the 60s when Dad was in his early 20s. He worked on the farm with his father, Bill, at the time. He hated it. He hated the stench that would only get worse when the heat came in the summer and picking up after the cows was the worst. See, the cows stayed in this huge barn. It was actually more like a big warehouse where... They're fed and kept throughout the night. They got to graze during the day, and throughout the night the cows would defecate and their feces drop to the concrete floor beneath them. Then in the morning, when the cows would go out to graze, my dad would take a really long hose and spray the droppings to the end of the building down a shaft that leads to a big tank below the barn. The tank would fill with the droppings, and once a week we had a guy that would come by and empty the tank and dispose of the waste. It was really nasty work, but my dad did it nonetheless. Well, my grandfather decided that it was just too much work to do on the farm with just himself and my dad, so they decided to hire another farmhand. They didn't get anyone interested in the job for the first few weeks until they met a man at a local feed store named Fred. He was in his late 20s and eager to work. He hadn't had a job in years and was desperate for pay since his wife was pregnant with their first child. My grandfather hired him right there in that feed store and by the next day, Fred was on the farm working harder than anyone my dad had ever seen work. He was determined and super ambitious. He was constantly running around the farm fixing stuff that needed fixing and trying to learn absolutely everything it was that they did. He loved the job and told everyone how he just wanted to be good at what he was being paid to do. He believed in good honest work and that people should earn the money they're working for. My dad admitted he loved having Fred around not just because he worked hard but also because he was gullible and pretty easily manipulated, I guess. My dad had certain tasks given to him by my grandpa throughout the day, and each time he was told to do something, he just passed that task along to Fred. He didn't mind because he didn't know, and my dad didn't care because it meant less of the work that he hated. About four months went by with Fred doing most of the work around the farm, and my dad even started to find it a little funny that he really would do whatever he was told. Without question, he was happy to do it. 
One hot summer morning, the cows had just gone out to graze and my grandpa told my dad to spray the droppings down the shaft at the end of the barn like he usually did. My dad then passed the job along to Fred as he sat along the side of the barn to have a smoke. When Fred was done, he came outside to tell my dad that he had an idea that he thought would highly benefit the farm. He told my dad that if he emptied the tank below the barn themselves, they would be able to use the cow feces as manure in the fields. It would fertilize the plants and make them grow bigger and faster. My dad told me that at first he thought the idea was stupid, but then he figured it would be funny to see if Fred actually tried and emptied that feces tank, so he agreed. He didn't tell my grandpa because he knew he never would have approved and he just wanted to see how this would play out. He showed Fred where to go to the release valve and empty the tank into the big barrels. He told him to be very careful and to not turn the valve too fast, otherwise the line would get clogged and they'd have to call someone to fix it. My dad then left Fred alone to do what he had planned and decided to take a walk around the barn to check the gates and make sure everything was in order. What my dad didn't know at the time was that Fred would end up turning the valve too fast and the line would end up getting clogged. Fred would then open the tank from above and reach a pole into the sludge to try and dislodge whatever was blocking the line. My dad heard screaming coming from inside the barn and he rushed over to see what was wrong. He made his way down into the tank and was horrified by what he found. Fred had fallen into the huge 5,000 gallon tank that hadn't been emptied for a week and was now drowning in the thick feces, desperately reaching out for help. By the time my dad got to the top of the ladder and looked into the tank, all he could see was Fred's hand poking out of the brown goo. He grabbed onto it and tried pulling him out, but he had no leverage at all on the top of that tank. He managed to pull Fred up long enough for him to tell my dad that he was just trying to fix it himself since he knew that they'd have to pay someone for his mistake. He felt bad, and my dad reassured him everything would be okay to just hold on. And that's when his grip failed and Fred plunged back under the thick excrement once again. This time, no part of Fred's body was able to be grabbed onto to possibly rescue him. My dad had no idea what to do so he ran across the farm as fast as he could to get my grandpa, who immediately called the police. And by the time they made it back to the tank, Fred's hand had disappeared under the sludge and there was nothing my dad and grandpa could do but wait. The police showed up with firemen and they didn't know much of what to do either. They ended up reaching a metal pole down into the tank with a sort of loop on the end and when they pulled Fred out, it was very clear that he had passed. My dad was horrified and felt like it was his fault. He knew it was a bad idea, but thought it would be funny. He could have stopped Fred, but his own arrogance let him do it. Fred's wife became a widow and she never remarried. She named their son after him and eventually moved out of town. My dad made a point to work as hard as Fred did every day for the rest of his life in honor of the man whose death he felt he was responsible for. My dad passed away in 2018 and the last thing he said to me was to never take advantage of someone's hard work. I don't do much writing when it comes to stories about my own personal life, so bear with me as I take you on this weird, scary, and absolutely awful experience that was my life for two months in 2015. The best place to get started is by giving a little background. My two friends and I decided we wanted to rent a house in LA since we all got jobs in the area and had dreamt of living together after we all got out of college. We got a pretty decent price for rent that was split between all of us, but also thought that if we had one more person as a roommate, the rent would be perfect. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, so we had the space and my friend Molly said she knew someone who needed a place anyways, so it would be perfect. We all met her and got along great in the short amount of time we spent with her, so we all agreed it would be a good fit between the four of us. Our new roommate's name was Dove, and for the first month that she lived with us, she was amazing. She did her share of the housework, and honestly, for the most part, she stayed pretty much to herself. She never had people over and never complained and was generally one of the sweetest girls I'd ever met. We all used to talk about how lucky we were to find a roommate as great as Dove. That was until she met the man that would become her boyfriend, Ty. The first time she brought Ty over to the house, the three of us were shocked. 
He was covered in tattoos, including his face, and he reeked of marijuana and just had the worst attitude of anyone we'd all collectively had ever met. Dove, on the other hand, either seemed not to notice or didn't really care. She took him into her room and thankfully we didn't see either of them for the rest of the night. The next morning we woke up to our TV, vintage stereo system, and our freaking microwave completely gone. Obviously, Ty had done this since he was the only person in the house besides the four of us girls, and we were livid. We banged on Dove's door until she came out and confronted her about it. Instead of denying it like we expected, she told us that she'd actually just given him the stuff. He said he needed it, and she just told him to take it. She didn't see the problem and got mad at us for yelling at her for allowing him to just steal our things. She said she'd replace what was taken, but that was never really the point. We decided to forgive her, but told her if she was going to continue living with us, she couldn't have Ty over again since he was clearly terrible. She didn't like that, but agreed. A week went by and nothing of significance happened. Then one random Tuesday night when the three of us were watching a movie while Dove was out, we heard the door open and to our shock, in walked Dove holding the hand of Ty. She walked right by us like we told her the week before meant nothing to her and slammed the door when they got into her room. We decided on spending the night in the living room to possibly prevent him from taking anything else, but not even that worked. On his way out, Dove told him he could take whatever he wanted from the fridge. He grabbed a grocery bag and practically acted like he was shopping as he took most of what was in there as we yelled at Dove that he was not allowed to take our stuff again. They ignored us like we weren't even there. Neither of them would even look in our direction. Ty just walked out of the door, and we stared as Dove made her way back to her bedroom, saying nothing, as we asked her to explain what was going on with her lately. It didn't take long for us to realize Ty had gotten her hooked on pills and was just her hookup. It's why she never said no to him. To her, it seemed like getting what she wanted was all that really mattered. We watched for months as she deteriorated in front of her eyes, and the three of us had to move everything into our bedrooms to make sure it wouldn't get stolen in the night and installed locks on all of our doors since Dove and Ty constantly had random druggies come over to our house. No matter what we did or how much we begged, Dove refused to see things logically or from our point of view. So we did what any sane person would do in a situation like this. We waited for Ty and his friends to come over and we promptly called the police. They told us to leave the house before they got there and we went to our neighbor's house and watched out the window as an actual SWAT team arrived and raided the place. Ty and a couple of his friends were arrested for multiple different things involving drug possession and sales, which we did mention, but we never expected this kind of reaction from the police. Dove was let go since Ty took the blame for everything. We were relieved. We thought maybe this would mean that Dove could finally kick this habit, get some help, and just be done with that monster. They did end up searching the whole house, including our bedrooms, and the place was a disaster by the time we were allowed back in. Dove was irate. She screamed at us and told us that we ruined her life. We tried telling her that she needed to get help, but she refused and said that she'd be moving out as soon as possible since we had apparently betrayed her. We felt bad for her in the situation that she was in, but we were all kind of relieved too. Now, a couple of weeks after Ty's arrest, we were all hanging out in the living room not expecting what was about to happen. All of a sudden, the door burst open, and in came four guys wearing blue and black ski masks. They ran over to us as we were screaming and grabbed the three of us as one went into Dove's room and pulled her out as she was kicking and screaming. They dragged us outside, put us in a van that was waiting outside with the driver as the rest of them piled into a car behind us. I was positive the neighbors had heard what was happening and all I could do was hope that one of them had called the police. Once we were in the van, one of the men took our phones and told us all to be quiet. He drove for at least an hour with no words spoken until the van pulled over. They opened the door and threw us out. We were standing in the middle of a dirt field as they tied our hands behind our backs. Dove seemed the calmest as we all were beginning to beg for our lives. They told us we shouldn't have ratted out Ty and that we'd be paying for it with our lives. We all started to cry and beg and plead, but Dove, she seemed like she was laughing, and she started cracking up and calling us babies for crying. She told the guys to untie her hands and that it was a funny joke, but that she was over it and just let us go. 
Instead of doing what she said, one of the guys just decked her really hard in the face and told her to shut up, and she hit the ground hard and then started crying herself. I actually believed then and there that I was going to die. These men were going to murder us and that would be it. I was just hoping that they'd find my family so my family could maybe get some closure from my death. And those were the thoughts that I was thinking. Begging wasn't doing anything. We watched in horror as the men who had taken us began digging these large holes just in front of us, and I was sure that that's where we would be buried. Just as I had started to come to terms with the fact that my life would be ending that night, in the distance I could see flashing lights speeding towards us, and I burst into tears. We were saved. The men tried to run, but it was a big dirt field and there was nowhere for them to go. The police officers got over to us, untied our hands, and thankfully they were able to apprehend all four men, and we were escorted to the hospital. We didn't have any serious injuries, so we were let go that night. We all eventually went to my mom's house just outside of LA and waited to hear from the police about what was being done to ensure these men stayed in jail. They were all charged with kidnapping and assault as well as conspiracy to murder. All four of them ratted on each other as well as Ty and their sentence ranged from, and I kid you not, 17 to 25 years, and we were glad this meant none would have the chance to finish what they started anytime soon. I guess that night was a wake-up call for Dove, as she was also arrested and tried for being an accomplice. All of my roommates have kept in contact, except obviously Dove, but we agreed we didn't want to live in that house after that happened. I still live with my mom. Molly and our friend Jenna live together in a small apartment in LA and we all get together from time to time for lunch. I have PTSD from that night and still get nightmares about it. I'm just glad I have my parents to help me get through it. And I urge anyone to be there for their friends if they notice red flags alluding to drug abuse. Even if they say they aren't ready to quit, sometimes just knowing there is a person that cares means more than you'll ever know. I hate dogs. Please don't be mad at me when I tell you that. I'm not some psycho who thinks dogs don't have souls or they're evil, I actually used to love dogs. I was so excited when I moved in with my buddy who had four of them so you can imagine I was a little disappointed when he told me not to interact with them. He said that they were only tame around him and his girlfriend and if anyone else came near them they'd quote unquote freak out. It was a little scary to think about four very large dogs who hated me living only a wall away but my friend was usually pretty good about locking his door when he left or putting them out in the backyard if he was going to be gone longer than a day or so. One summer, my roommate said he and his girlfriend were going to visit his family a couple of states away and that he'd be leaving the dogs in the backyard for a few nights. He had automatic feeders and the dogs had access to this weird pedo-activated watering system so there was no need for me to go out and give them anything. The backyard was pretty huge and he assured me that they'd be fine and out of my way all weekend. I felt safe knowing that they'd be out of the house. No one was able to control those dogs except my roommate, so keeping them away from all the people while he was gone was definitely the right move. The day came where my roommate and his girlfriend left. I woke up and went downstairs for some coffee and looked out the sliding glass door at the four dogs as they stood there staring at me. Now these were all huge German shepherds, so seeing them growl at me but not being able to do anything about it kind of made me laugh a little bit. I went through my regular morning routine and got ready for work. I left the rest of the day and came home around 6pm after going to the gym. As I entered the kitchen I noticed something was very wrong. There was glass all over the kitchen floor and the sliding glass door was shattered. And that's when I started to hear the growling coming from behind me. I didn't even have to turn around to figure out what the sound was coming from. I did what any smart person would do and ran as fast as I could up the stairs into my room. The whole time I was running it felt like that dog was going to latch onto my leg at any moment. I slammed the door shut behind me and grabbed at my pocket to get my phone out and call 911. Except it wasn't there. The pocket was empty. I wanted to cry when I realized that I'd left my phone in my car and my gym bag. I felt so stupid. And you're probably wondering why I didn't just call for help outside the window. Well, I would have if we didn't live a mile from the next house. My roommate insisted on living in the country so his dogs could have a big yard to run around. 
I was really regretting moving in as I sat there wondering what the hell I was going to do to get myself out of that situation. I didn't even know where the other dogs were. I had only seen one when I made my way upstairs and I guess I could have overlooked them in the panic. Maybe the others were chasing me too. I leaned against the door and sat there for a few seconds before bang. Something huge and heavy was smashing itself against the door. Growling came soon after and I quickly realized the dogs were actually trying to get into my room. I didn't know if they were rabid or something, but I couldn't just sit there and wait for them to get to me. With the progress they were making on the door, I knew that they'd get to me at some point. The banging didn't last long before the scratching started. It was even louder than the banging and would quickly grant them access into the room if they continued to tear at that door. It was clearly very flimsy. I ran into the connecting bathroom and closed the door behind me. Listening to them scratch and gnaw their way through my door was mental torture. Getting ripped apart by dogs was not the way I wanted to leave this world. There isn't a single moment in my life where I wished I had access to a landline until that moment just then. I heard the door finally giving way and the dogs finally entered my room as they growled and barked. It was the kind of growl where, even without seeing it, you could tell that their teeth were showing. I still couldn't tell how many dogs were out there, I just knew that it was more than one. I tried my hardest not to move or make a sound, but the sweat on my hands made a squeaking sound when they slid across the floor as I tried to get up. My heart dropped and I knew I was screwed. They started their assault on my bathroom door and I had no choice but to get into my bathroom counter and climb through the very small rectangular window about three feet above the sink. I squeezed myself through and laid on the roof out of sight of the dogs in case they got into the bathroom as well. Hours went by before they got in. I felt safe though and this was the moment I realized that I had an injury on my left calf. The adrenaline must have worn off because the pain was getting worse by the second. I pulled up the leg of my pants and revealed a pretty severe bite along the back of my leg, and I kept wondering how long I didn't notice when that happened, but there was no changing anything then. Thankfully, the bleeding had mostly stopped, but I still wrapped it up with the flannel that I was wearing. I didn't need it exposed to whatever was on that roof. It was obviously the only choice I had was to wait on the roof for my roommate to get home a couple of days from then. I couldn't jump down because the dogs would get me. If I did jump down... I wouldn't be able to drive away because my car keys were downstairs in the house and I wasn't going to risk going inside again. I was safe on the roof and that was all that mattered. I didn't have food but thankfully there was a spigot only a few feet from where I was sitting. It was a considerably large house and the spigot was installed to easily hose off the roof if needed. I never knew what that was necessary for but I of course was grateful to have access to water for the next couple of days that I guess I would be spending on that roof. The hunger wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. The worst part was hearing the dogs make their way through the house at night looking for me and thank god they never found me though. My friend came back Monday morning and was shocked to find me on the roof. He gathered his dogs in his bedroom and helped me back into the house. When he found out what happened he begged me not to tell the police or animal control. But I had no choice. One of his dogs had bitten me and they were so vicious that if they ever got out I had no doubt that they probably would kill somebody. I went to the hospital and was treated for the bite wound and I was advised to get the rabies shot treatments and wasn't too happy about that but it was smart so I went along with it. The dogs were impounded and after evaluation it was ruled that they would be humanely euthanized. My roommate blamed me for having his dogs killed but I can't say I regret their outcome. I feel like lives may have been saved by them being euthanized. I try not to blame the dogs since I've known so many amazing shepherds in my life, but I do have this trauma. It turns out the sliding glass door had been broken in by a tree, pushed down by the strong winds earlier in the day after I'd left for work. Most large dogs scare me now, and I can say that I don't particularly like dogs in general anymore because of this incident. It's disappointing, but oh well. I got my two cats, and that's perfect for me for the time being. Hopefully one day I can find the love for dogs I once had. I think the real moral of the story is to not move in with a guy who is open about having aggressive dogs. The story took place when I was and about 8 years old, so it's a bit blurry in some of the details. For context, I'm a female, and I used to live in a condo up in Montana, 
So I shared a backyard with all of my neighbors, and we were all very interactive with each other. Since this took place around December, there had been piles of snow sometimes reaching five foot tall next to our driveway from shoveling that I would use to sled down. Now, in our old neighborhood, most of the kids' ages were ranging from around five to ten, except one, whom in this story I'll call Robin since it is close to his name, but for our privacy. Robin was 14 years old when this took place, so almost everyone was half his age. Robin was not out of the house much, but when he was, I noticed he was very aggressive to all of the kids. Like, he would actually literally body slam kids and even pick on them for being weak. I hadn't seen him much, as I last previously said, He wasn't out of the house much, so I hadn't really talked much with him. Robin was nice to me, but not as nice to the boys in our neighborhood. Because of the fact he was older, he basically saw himself as better than us, if that makes sense. More or less like the top dog. He used that against everything, and really, I kind of dreaded seeing him. But one night specifically... I was out later than usual working on building an igloo with all the snow from the driveway. I was at the downspout trying to knock the ice off the gutters when I saw him coming up to me. I was a little annoyed since I was out at night just to have some alone time, but I brushed it off. Soon he came up to me striking up a conversation and he showed me how to knock the ice off. I said thanks and grabbed my sled and showing him to my snow hill but he was not very interested in what I had to say. I can't exactly remember how the conversation led off to this, but he had started talking about random things that he had done, such as kissing girls and other kind of sexual stuff, like all the things he had done in school bathrooms and with other people. I was weirded out, but really just kept sledding down the hill and listening. By that point, he had moved behind the small hill that I had been sledding down, He then started kind of pacing around, and he then said, Hey, I have a question. But before I had a chance to reply, he then said, Actually, never mind, it's too dirty. But for some reason, this didn't strike me as odd, which really makes me want to slap myself to this day. But I still asked him, No, tell me. He kept this loop going for almost a minute, saying that he couldn't, or that it was too dirty for me. Then he had broke. I wasn't expecting anything that bad, but then he said, Okay, fine. I was gonna say, let's play a game of rock, paper, scissors, except that if I win, then we have to kiss. But if you win, then we don't have to unless you want to. I then froze. I was shocked, since he was literally twice my age. I sat there for what felt like 10 minutes, but was actually about 3 seconds. Luckily, I thought quick enough and said, Okay, wait, hold on, I have to grab something. And I shot up and ran to my door. I then cracked it closed and sat there for about 10 seconds, not knowing what to do. I didn't feel safe outside anymore. I then went back out and I told him that I had to go inside because my mom said it was too late which was a lie. Surprisingly, he just said okay, and then we said our goodbyes. I went inside, and I went and sat near my mom, who was working on her computer. Now I have anxiety, which only made this worse. I thought that if I told my mom, then I would have gotten in trouble for asking him what he meant when he said all that. But then, after a while of sitting there, I realized that I should just tell her, since I can never even keep anything to myself, as I'm a loud mouth. I expected her to yell at me and get mad, but she really just turned to me with a concerned look and was very shocked. That was very relieving for me, since I was literally shaking in fear. In the next few days, I had to talk to some police officers about it. He moved a few months later, and I have no doubt that it's to get a fresh start and to get away from the problems. I can understand why this doesn't seem scary to others, but it's really scary as an eight-year-old with anxiety, and also with the fact that I was always so unsettled near him. 
His presence was very uncomfortable from the start. Now, I'm really sorry for the lack of detail, since this was quite a long time ago. But parents, listen to your child if they tell you something like this. And always be aware of who you're talking to. Thanks for listening. My story started in 2014, when we had to move out of our rented seafront flat that we liked a lot. I was 28 then. We got about two months notice to find another place. We didn't have many options. We found a house which was converted into three flats. We shared a tiny hallway with our neighbor. The flat was newly decorated, but pretty much as soon as we moved in, we noticed that there were many things very wrong there. The back door's lock was broken. Because of this, the kitchen was full of bugs and slugs, and we reported it to the agency. A guy came out to fix the lock, and he asked me if I had met my new neighbor yet. I said no, I hadn't. He then said, He's a very weird guy. Later on, I met him. Yeah, he looked weird. I couldn't tell if he was 30 or 60, but he was always very quiet and polite. One day though, funny enough, it was April 1st, and we went home after work with my boyfriend. Our neighbor and his friend was just leaving the house. My friends were supposed to come over that evening. We had quickly cleaned the house, and once we finished, we sat down. Then... I heard a weird banging noise from the neighbor's flat. Someone was coming down the stairs, and it sounded like they had dropped a really heavy bag. But then I heard it again, and again. They cannot be this clumsy, I thought, but I didn't think much of it. Soon after this, I saw my friends arriving through the window. I went to the main door to let them in, and I then saw blood everywhere a bloody handprint on our door. I was shocked. I then told my boyfriend that there was blood everywhere. Close the door, he replied. Then, I had heard my neighbor saying to me that I stabbed the woman who regularly visits me in a very calm voice. I closed the door. The woman was laying in the middle of the road in front of the house, not moving at all. By this time, the ambulance and the police were at the scene too. They took my neighbor, closed down the house, and the whole street as well. We were then told that we weren't allowed to use the hallway, as it was a crime scene, so we couldn't leave the house for a while. I had noticed blood coming down from the drain pipe too at the backyard. God knows how. About five weeks later, the police were knocking on our door, asking if we saw our neighbor as he had left the hospital, and they're very concerned for his safety, and they asked us to contact them immediately if we see him. The light in the hallway wasn't working for a while, so I asked my boyfriend to have a look at it, as I didn't want to bump into the neighbor in the dark. He went outside and took it apart. We later found out that it wasn't working because it was on the neighbor's electrical circuit, as his electricity was turned off. While we were in the hallway, Unexpectedly, the neighbor opened his door to check what this noise was. We were shocked. When did you come home? We asked. We didn't hear you coming in. It's because I didn't use a key. So if you lock yourself out, just ask me. I can open the doors for you. I guess this was the moment when we were truly scared for our lives. He then explained that he came home because he feels completely normal and he felt like he shouldn't be in a mental hospital. He didn't want to kill that woman. He just stabbed her in her thigh because she provoked him. Keep in mind, the police never confirmed anything to us. They just said that it was close to a murder investigation. We went back to the flat, and we were too scared to even call the police, as it would have been pretty obvious that we reported him. Later that day, the police came back and took him and they told us off in front of him because we didn't report him. We never saw the neighbor again after that. And to this day, I still have no idea what's going on with him. The other issues with the house became severe as well. 
so we moved out as soon as it was possible. We now refer to that house as the Horror House. This happened nine years ago. I had just ended a four-year relationship and had moved into an old building in downtown Paris. I had to start all over again from scratch. Well, I did the mistake to let my ex-girlfriend keep a lot of my furniture, kitchen cutlery, pans, coffee machine, etc. At the time, I had worked as a waiter, so I could only afford a one-room apartment from a council estate building. It was really old and barely even clean, but at least I had a roof over my head. The first two weeks, nothing had happened, but quickly, I began to hear someone talking at night. It was kind of like mumblings. It basically said, Just go and die already. When I looked into the door of Judah, I saw a scrawny shirtless guy smiling and scratching the door with his finger. This became a thing every two or three nights. He would come and threaten me through the door or sing songs with a really childish voice. I thought about opening the door and asking him what he wanted, but I was afraid that he had a knife or something and I couldn't see his hands while looking into the door of Judah. What really stunned me is that he acted totally normal whenever I stumbled upon him during the day, and he actually denied being the one to do this at night. I even got mad at him for it, but he seemed to genuinely not understand what the hell I was talking about. One day I came home with a girl that I had met at a bar that I was working at. For some reason, she had left during the night, and I went back to sleep. The mumbling started again, only this time, it felt really close. I opened my eyes only to witness the scrawny neighbor now headbutting the wall and singing what sounded like a mix between religious chants and also a lullaby in slow motion. I was honestly totally paralyzed by the fear. I tried to communicate with him, but he was just grinning and he ended up exiting the apartment by himself. I decided I had enough and finally decided to call the police. They took him in all right and he ended up getting put into a psych ward. Apparently this guy had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and he was put in a psychiatric hospital because of it. He wasn't supposed to live at his place anymore. He had apparently ran away from the hospital two months ago. He initially got sent into the psych ward after bashing a shovel into a postman's head, putting him into a coma. He did that for absolutely no reason at all. I never saw him again and I moved out two years after that. Back in the day, I used to work for the National Trust up in Scotland. It was a really lonely job, with a lot of it spent either driving long distances or walking around the highlands in dire weather conditions. At work, I used to drive around this big 4x4, but off-duty, I had to use my own car, which was absolutely crap. So this one Saturday, I planned to drive back down to England for my mom's birthday. Me and my boyfriend had this whole big thing planned for her. I'd drive down in the morning, help get set up, then I'd go and pick mom up for the big surprise. I was massively excited about it, and massively confident that my mom would be over the moon with it. What I wasn't confident about was the ability of my poor little Nissan Micra to get me there without giving me trouble. I was driving through the highlands, absolute arse end of nowhere and all, and the engine started making some really unhealthy noises. I pulled over to the side of the road, but I couldn't work out what was wrong. I thought I'd be able to get it to a garage and risk being a little bit late, but when I got back in my car and tried starting it up again, nothing. The engine was trying to turn over, just never coming to life, and no matter how hard I tried or what little tricks I tried to pull, I just couldn't get the car to start. These days, I'd have just pulled up an app and had a bloke out for repairs or a tow within an hour or so. But back then, in the age of flip phones and spotty mobile reception, breaking down in the middle of nowhere could be a huge pain in the bottom. I tried the engine a few more times while mentally preparing myself to actually get out and walk. This was in the middle of November, by the way, so it was absolutely freezing as it was, but then the highland gales meant the idea of walking anywhere was grim beyond belief. I fought it for as long as I could, but in the end, I fastened up my coat whacked on my hat and gloves, and got out of my car to face the cold. The plan was to walk to the nearest anything, which hopefully had a phone or someone capable of engine repairs, but then no sooner had I started walking, but a car suddenly appeared in the distance. 
Each side of the road was lined with trees, and the road kind of snaked off in the distance, so the car's appearance took me by surprise at first. I actually said a prayer to myself that whoever it was would pull over for me, and when they did, I thought those prayers had been answered. But at the risk of sounding a bit melodramatic, I don't think it was God that answered my prayers that day, rather than his opposite number downstairs. Anyways, the car pulls over and this quite friendly looking middle-aged man rolls down the window and asks if I'm alright. I explain the situation, tell him where my car is, and he says that depending on how bad the damage is, he might be able to get his mate to come and fix it on the cheap. I just about danced a little jig that I was so happy. Then he invites me into his car and gives me a lift back to mine. We made a bit of small talk after I noticed his English accent and we both swapped stories explaining why we were both up in Scotland. After we pulled up behind my car, he pulled out his mobile and started texting someone, apparently the person who was going to come fix my car. When I asked him, he explained that up in the Highlands, it was much better to send texts with that little signal you could muster. It was a little slower in terms of response time and all, but the message actually went through loud and clear instead of garbled and spotty. He told me not to worry though, as his mechanic friend worked Saturdays and was probably close to a phone. Those of you in your 20s might not remember the ritual of holding your plastic brick of a phone high above your head to try and force a text message through, but after a minute or so of that, my Highland Samaritan assured me that the text had both been received and read. Everything was looking hunky-dory. All I had to do was to be patient and hope for the best. Within a few minutes, the kind stranger's phone had buzzed and he reported that his mate was on the way although he wouldn't be arriving for another 20 minutes or so. 20 minutes I could deal with, and if the guy could get me to my mum's surprise party on time, the one I'd spent a month planning, I was willing to give him everything I had in my wallet. But then, as I sat waiting with the bloke, still making the same small talk, I noticed that he changed some minor detail in his story. I won't bore you with the ins and out of it, but he basically told me his business was in one place, and then about 10 to 15 minutes later, he told me it was based somewhere else. I didn't jump on the sudden change of detail or anything, I mean, a business can have more than one branch, can it? And people misspeak all the time, so I'm not exactly going to act all Sherlock Holmes on a bloke who's supposedly doing me a favor, am I? That was the first red flag, you might say. One I didn't really acknowledge until after the event itself. It was only the second that actually caught my attention. After a brief lull in the conversation, the man asked if anyone was expecting me. He used that exact same phrase too, expecting you, and I must have given him a funny look or something because he clarified with, you know, have you got any plans later? I started telling him about my mom's party, how I'd been planning it for ages, how my whole family expected me to be there, and instead of showing any interest or enthusiasm whatsoever, he sort of nodded and started staring off into the distance like he was thinking about something. That wasn't what got me though. It was how he'd phrased the question. Was anyone expecting me? And then considering he was apparently just bringing his mate to fix my car and I hadn't heard what they'd said to each other. It all added up to a really bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Call it a woman's intuition but I knew I had to do something, anything to try to get ahead of what I feared the most. I asked the guy how long his mechanic friend is going to be, and after his long and contemplative state, he snapped right back into his friendly. He checked his phone and then told me, it seems like it's only going to be a few more minutes. So I put my little plan into action. I told the bloke that I had to grab a few things from my car just in case it needed a tow or I had to go anywhere, then slipped out of his car and walked towards my own. Once I was there, I put on a show of looking for things and when what I was doing in actual fact was delaying time until his mechanic friend arrived. If it was some bloke in overalls driving his work van, then yeah, I probably had nothing to worry about. But anything else, I'd put phase two of my plan into action. I kept at it for a few minutes, fishing around for absolutely nothing while keeping my eyes glued to the road behind us. Then lo and behold, a big white van comes from around the bend a few hundred yards behind us, then starts pulling in behind the stranger's car. The van was all white, no marking on it at all, and it looked brand new. On top of that, 
There were two people sitting in the cab, not just one as I'd been expecting. Like I said, if everyone's intentions were good, then me acting a bit paranoid wasn't going to do anyone any harm. The mechanic and his friend might think that I was a bit weird, but weird I can live with. What I couldn't live with was the feeling I was walking into some kind of trap. The moment the van started to pull in behind the stranger's car, I hurried back to him and told him something like, I I'm just going to nip for a wee. I'll be back in a few. At that, I scurried off into the trees at the side of the road and kept myself crouched and out of sight as if I was actually having a wee. But in actual fact, I'm just watching the seemingly kind stranger and his friends to make sure that they didn't have anything planned. I stayed where I was, telling myself I wouldn't move until I got a good look at the two blokes who'd just pulled up in the van, but the minutes ticked by and no one moved. Eventually I heard the stranger's voice calling me from the side of the road. He sounded friendly at first, and just let me know that the blokes were working on my car. Only thing was, I could see a bit of my car, and there was no one standing near it. I still felt like I was going half mad at this point, that I'd gotten myself into a tizzy and had completely overreacted. Then, right as I told myself that I was going to feel very silly after this if the guys really were there just to fix my car, the stranger's tone of voice changed dramatically. That alone sent a chill through me, but what truly terrified me was when he used my name. At no point in our conversation had we ever swapped names or introduced ourselves formally. I know that sounds a bit mental, since I was sitting with the bloke for the better part of a half hour, but my mind was on other things, and evidently his was too because he never bothered to introduce himself either. I know there's always a chance that I let it slip during our chat and just not remembered it, but I certainly didn't know his name, which made it all the more frightening when he told me to show myself. He made it clear that if I didn't, it wouldn't be good for me and that I might actually get to my mum's party on time if I just did as he told me. Squatting down among the clump of trees, trying to stay out of sight of those not-so-benevolent strangers, they made for the scariest few moments of my entire life. I didn't think it was possible to get any more frightened than that, but I was wrong. Suddenly I heard an engine start up, but I knew from how healthy it sounded that it wasn't mine. The next thing... I see the stranger's car drive off, and that's the first stranger who picked me up, not the two strangers in the van. I thought that might mean that the van was about to drive off too, so I poked my head out from behind the trees a wee bit to get a better look. That's when I see a man, wearing a balaclava, walking through the trees with his head on a swivel like he's searching for me. Remember what I said about being wrong regarding how scared I could be? I can actually remember most of the stuff that happened, but after seeing that guy in his mask, quite obviously searching for yours truly, my memory actually gets a bit spotty. I know I just ran, further and faster and harder than I ever ran in my life. I remember being sick a bit when I couldn't run any further, and I remember many cars passing me before a driver finally bothered to stop to see if I was actually okay. I also remember being frightened out of my wits that the first stranger or the guys in the van would come across me, but thankfully that didn't happen. Instead, I was driven to a police station where I gave a statement. After that came a trip to a mechanics which resulted in me finding out my car wouldn't be roadworthy for at least 24 hours. After that, I got a room and a bed and breakfast, got myself a late lunch, and cried on the phone to my mom up in my room. I actually think it was the single worst day of my life. I let my mum down, had a dip into my savings to pay for engine repairs, and it was just a complete nightmare of a day, and to top it all off, I almost got kidnapped or murdered as well. I just didn't think things like that happened in real life, or if they did, I certainly didn't think it had ever happened to me. I was able to give a really detailed description of the first guy along with what car he was driving, but as for the other two men, I didn't have much to say aside from what their van looked like. The police promised that they'd do all they could, and they even got the first guy in for questioning. But given that he hadn't actually broken any laws, they were unable to charge him with anything. The police had asked him about the masked men in the white van, but he just claimed he didn't know what they were talking about. According to him, he tried to do a favor to a young woman whose car had broken down, 
and the next thing, she's off into the woods in a blind panic. They let him go, but I know he was involved in it, and I know he only let me see his face because he thought I was a done deal. But if that's the case, how many other women and girls have his tactics worked on? And that's the thought I find myself living with after all these years. I can be thankful and grateful in whatever else I can be that I didn't end up a victim that day, but I can't be the only one. There have to be more. Girls who didn't get away. And it haunts me to wonder where they are now. I am a proud Floridian. At the time of this story, early 2000s, I was going to college in South Florida, and I lived with my family in my hometown located in the Panhandle. It's about a seven hour drive up through Central Florida to get between my school and my house, so I mostly went home just for the holidays. It was the Thanksgiving of my junior year, and I was excited that I had been able to rearrange my midterms to be able to leave campus three days ahead of everyone else. I was expecting to beat the masses of traffic, and I was hoping for a quick trip back home. My roommates wanted to have one last meal together before we all left for break. So we all met up at the campus dining hall around 4pm, and I set off on my journey around 5.30. Around 10pm, I was just a bit more than halfway there. I always stopped at this mom and pop kind of diner by the side of the highway to grab some food used the restroom, and called my dad to let him know that I was okay. I didn't have a cell phone back then. Well, I hadn't been through here since summer, and unfortunately the place went out of business. So, a bit bummed out that I wasn't going to be able to get my chocolate chip pancakes, I just kept going. There really wasn't much build up around there at the time. So when I saw signs for a rest stop in, of all places on God's green earth, some bumfuck town called Alachua, I went and parked directly under the streetlight for safety and used the facilities, called my dad on the payphone, etc. I didn't see anyone else there, except for a very exhausted looking woman, who asked me for directions, saying that she was with her husband and two small children, and they had made a wrong turn trying to get to Disney. Alachua is about 150 miles from Disney World, so I left the rest area, and was walking back to my car, when I noticed a beat up, unmarked, bluish gray work van parked very close to the driver's side door of my 95 Honda Civic. I thought, yeah, okay, that's pretty weird. Of course, it had Florida tags on it. So it couldn't have been the lady I talked to before. I distinctly remember she said she was from Virginia. I turned around and hightailed it back to the rest stop, promptly running into some random middle-aged guy who had two little boys with him. It turns out that it was his wife that I had spoken to before. She emerged from the bathroom a second later. I told him what was going on with the van and how I didn't know what to do. He said that he would go and check it out. So he left the kids with his wife, then walked up to the driver's side door of the van. He stood there for a moment before speaking. His voice awkwardly quivered, but I could hear him yelling from where we were standing, about a hundred feet away. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. We've already called the police, so I'm going to have to politely suggest that you get out of here. He then ran back to us, grabbed his wife and kids, and pointed to me with a swift, You, come on, let's get in the car, now and we all ran back to his car together. Very confused, sitting in the back seat of a stranger's SUV, while he went and used the payphone, presumably to call the police. Meanwhile, the van pulled out of there. I had never seen someone get the out of there quite like they got the out of there. They ran up onto the curb on their way out. They burned rubber. It was almost comical. The cops got there and I found out what happened. The man went to go check out the van, and he could see inside pretty well, because I had parked under the streetlight. The first thing he noticed was that all the seats except for the driver's seat had been removed. There was someone sitting in the driver's seat, 
and another guy hiding in the back, with a tarp laid out, and a bunch of other random items back there that I couldn't immediately identify. Neither of the men were reading a newspaper or a map. They were both apparently just sitting there, waiting. Still makes me sick just thinking about it. This happened when I was 14. I was home alone one weekend while my parents were at a work convention out of state. I was in my bedroom playing Rocket League with two of my friends. To clarify, they weren't in the room with me. I was talking to them on my headset. During the game, I heard a thump from downstairs. This wasn't unusual because I have two cats who wrestle each other sometimes, and they often make a lot of noise while they're doing it. So I assumed that's what it was and resumed my game. But I slightly turned on the volume to hear if the noise persisted. Two minutes later, I hear another thump. Followed by what sounded like a grunt. Hang on, guys. I think I hear something downstairs. Go check it out. We'll be here when you get back. I began to make my way downstairs, thinking that my cats were wrestling rougher than they usually do. But as I got about halfway, I froze. I could hear what sounded like men whispering to each other, coming from the living room. I crouched down to get a small peek into the living room and saw three men dressed in black. I felt my chest sink in when I saw them. I slowly went back upstairs. And of course, like in a typical horror film, the very last step made a loud creak. The entire house went silent. I knew that they heard it. Thinking on my feet, I quietly went to my room and threw on my headset. Guys, I need you to call 911. There are three men inside my house. Wh what? Look, I don't have time to explain. Just call the cops and send them to my house right now. I'm being 100% serious. I then threw my headset on the bed. I could hear footsteps coming up the stairs. I had to think fast. I knew that if I locked myself inside my room, they would know where I was. So I closed the door and snuck over to my parents' room, leaving the door open so they wouldn't think to check it. I know the logic is flawed, but I had to think fast. Five seconds later, I heard a pair of heavy boots hit the wooden floor, accompanied by two more sets. I then heard them get louder as they came down the hall and stopped outside my bedroom. I heard pounding on my bedroom door, followed by a deep voice saying, Open up kid, before I kick this door down. I lost my nerve and made a rash decision. I made a break from my parents' bedroom window and slid it open. I must have made a lot of noise while I was doing it, because I heard the footsteps coming towards my parents' bedroom now. I looked over my shoulder and saw a dark figure appear in the doorway. Get back here! The man yelled as he ran towards me. At this point, I tried jumping out of the window, but the man grabbed one of my ankles. Luckily, I was able to move my feet and slip out of my shoe, and I fell onto the small roof above my back porch. The man at the window jumped after me. I remember seeing a pair of boots coming right at me. I swear the man's feet would have gone right through me if I hadn't rolled off the roof at the last second. I landed awkwardly on my left ankle, but otherwise, I was okay. During all the commotion, one of the men ran downstairs to cut me off. Limping on one foot, I made it to the backyard gate before the man grabbed me and threw me to the ground. I tried to yell, but the man covered my mouth with his hand as the two other men climbed down from the window. The three of them began pulling me back into the house. But before they could get me through the door, I heard the sound of police sirens closing in. The men all looked at each other. Shit! They dropped me and ran towards the back gate. 
I limped my way to the front door and yanked it open and yelled at the police officers. Hey, they're in the backyard. Three of the officers ran towards the backyard, while another helped me to one of the police cars. They managed to catch one of the assailants, while the other two made it over the fence. They threw the man into one of the cruisers as I was giving my statement. Soon, the two friends I was playing online with pulled into the driveway on their bikes. Hey Gabe, are you okay? Yeah, I'm alright. Thanks for calling the cops for me. The man that was caught was charged with burglary and attempted kidnapping. It turns out that the men broke through the basement window. I'm thankful that I managed to escape with only a sprained ankle. My lesson to everyone listening is to always follow your gut and never ignore any sounds you hear while you're home alone. As luck would have it, I inherited a crappy piece of property in my early 30s when an uncle passed away. I know that sounds ungrateful, but if you had seen it, you would have laughed just like the rest of my family did. They teased me with countless haunted stories, due to the fact that the property was in a wooded area in the middle of nowhere. I decided that I might as well go out and take a look one weekend, but no one was available to go with me. Mom was afraid for me and made me promise to call every night, seeing as I left Friday afternoon and planned to come back on Saturday. I drove a van, so I had decided that I would sleep in it, even though there was a self-contained cabin there. Unlucky for me, I was advised that there was no running water, but I had already resigned myself to fixing the place up and selling it even if I got a low price for it. When I pulled up to the driveway on the four-acre property, I felt shivers going down my spine. I couldn't put my finger on why that happened, but I ignored it and continued to drive. The trees were so thick that I imagined myself getting lost, but soon I saw the cabin, which seemed too new to be in these shabby surroundings. There were a couple of abandoned old cars and a haphazard pile of rotting wood near the shed, which was next to the cabin. When I got out of my car, I felt icicles running through my veins. Maybe it was nerves, but I was sure I saw a shadow in the woods. I felt stupid but I called out. Hello? Of course, nothing was there, and the shadow disappeared. I actually thought it might have been a bear, so I raced to the front door and fiddled with the keys, eventually unlocking the door and letting myself in. There was no furniture apart from an old table and only one old chair. It was obvious that my uncle started doing the place up, but his death intervened. Thinking of him... I worried that his ghost might be haunting the cabin. Little did I realize at the time, the scariest things were to happen outside. I started to wonder if I would stay at all, but found myself dragging my bags and air mattress in. I sat at the table and ate a makeshift meal, making mental notes about what I had to do to get the place ready for sale. Then I heard a metallic noise not far from the back door. I couldn't be sure but it sounded like a knife or axe being sharpened. Fair enough, I do have an overactive imagination, but the sound was very real to me. Haunted stories usually don't scare me one bit, but when I looked out the back window, there was nothing to see at first. As soon as I moved to go back to the table, something caught my attention out of the corner of my left eye. I gasped when I turned back and saw what I thought was a huge, hulking silhouette staring at me from the edge of the woods. It was too small to be a bear, but why would there be a person out here in the middle of nowhere? I moved over to the window and had a second look, but it was gone. I could have kicked myself for not bringing a weapon with me. I didn't even have a multi-tool gadget. Even though I am female and was quite tough at the time, I'd been a tomboy all my life. I always had tools on me, but all I had at the time was a flashlight. Deciding not to be brave, 
I stayed in the cabin and wrote notes in my journal. I froze when I heard the metallic sound again. This time I was sure that it was inside the cabin. I got up and nervously crept around, saying, Who's there? Believe me when I tell you that I jumped out of my skin when a shadow walked past the window. The frightening thing was, I couldn't tell if the shadow had been in the front of the window or outside. In a panic, I ran over to the window and once again, I saw a huge silhouette closer to the cabin, but still at the edge of the woods. Rooted to the spot, I stared and barely blinked, trying my best to see if it was real. It seemed like hours went past, but eventually, I had to blink. When I did, the shadow disappeared. I really thought a crazy man was watching me, and I decided that I had to leave. But what if he was waiting for me outside? I gathered up my things and ran to the front door, but I stopped when I heard something fall over in the next room. Was he inside? I had no way of knowing, and I did not want to find out. I opened the door and ran as fast as I could to the car. I was so grateful when the engine started immediately. While driving off, I looked in the rearview mirror, and I swear, I could still see the outline of a person. But when I slowed down for one last look, they were gone. It might sound odd, but I actually gave the property away to my dad, who hasn't had any issues there at all. A few years ago, I took my grandma and her friend on holiday to Egypt. There were some really cheap packages for this resort town called Sharm El Sheikh, and they'd both been really poorly due to the cold weather over the winter, so I decided to do a good deed and pay for us all to get some sun for the week. Anyway, I booked the flights for February the 9th and we flew out from Heathrow in the morning. The heat was just what they needed and it was great getting to spend some quality time with them both. But after a couple of days, I started to get a touch of cabin fever. Like I said, my gran and her pal were content to spend the whole time by the pool, gabbing away and drinking non-alcoholic cocktails. Whereas me, on the other hand, I wanted to actually see a bit of the country that I came so far to visit. I wanted to soak up a bit of the culture, try some real authentic food instead of the o too familiar European style grub they'd served at the resort. I also wanted to mix with the locals and... As the calendar drew closer to Valentine's Day, I found myself longing for a different kind of company. Now's the time where I have to clear something up. I'm a gay man, I was still in my 30s at the time, and I was also very much available. I'm also not one for the holiday romances or one night stands, so at first, I didn't even think about dipping my toe into the local dating pool. But as I said, around Valentine's Day I found myself playing the hopeless romantic and wondering if there was anyone I could share a bit of romance with at such a special time of year. It sounds sappy, I know, but I'm prone to a bit of sappiness, so you'll have to forgive me. Anyway, since Egypt isn't exactly known for its acceptance of gay or lesbian lifestyles, I didn't reckon that there'd be any bars that I could pop into for a bit of harmless flirting. So instead, I decided to see who in the area was on Tinder. I brought up the app, changed my location, and did a bit of swiping here and there throughout the day. There were a few tourists, and only a handful of locals were brave enough to actually show their faces, but one did, and oh my days was he gorgeous. He was tall, dark, and handsome, every queen's dream, and his bio said that he worked as a resort manager. His English seemed really good from his profile, so I thought that I'd swipe right and see what came of it. I really didn't think that we'd match. He seemed way out of my league, so I just sort of resigned myself to it not happening and started planning a little trip into the old town so I could check out some of the old mosques and stuff. I jump a resort shuttle into the old town, have a little wander around the market and all that, and I'm taking pictures of all sorts of amazing things as I go. Then, on the way back towards the shuttle shop, I walk past somewhere with free Wi-Fi and since I had all my data off to save a few quid on the phone bill, I took the opportunity to log on to the Wi-Fi so I could send Grant a few photos as if to say, look what you're missing out on. Then right as I'm trying to send a photo, a Tinder match comes through. 
and it's the Egyptian Adonis that I had mentioned before. I couldn't believe it. I was just staring at the match in disbelief, thinking that this must be my lucky day. Then as I'm looking at the screen, he starts typing a hello. This was it. We talked for about half an hour back and forth as I walked up and down the streets just beaming to myself. When I told him that I was only there for a few more days, he asked if I wanted to meet that night. If I give him a few hours to get home from work and take a shower, I could be around by 7pm for dinner and a movie. He asked if I like pasta, and oh my god do I like pasta, and then when I said yes, he said that he'd make me some fresh and homemade. I was ready to fall in love right there, and after telling him that I'd give him a text in a few hours, I headed back to the resort. Gran knew something was up, she could tell by how much that I was smiling when I got back. She was a bit slower to accept me coming out than my parents were, but she got there in the end, and by that time she was very supportive. So when she recognized a bit of glow about me, she had no qualms about asking me 101 questions while she and her friend giggled back and forth like schoolgirls. I told her that I'd be having dinner with a friend and that if all went well, that I'd be back in the morning. When they'd finished giggling, Gran and her friend got awful sweet about the whole thing, wished me luck and told me to have a lovely time. The man I'd been texting, we'll just call him Mal, had given me the address of his flat near the old town. He said he couldn't offer me any wine, but that the pasta sauce was on the stove and he was very excited to see me. I was excited to see him too, really excited actually, too excited to consider if maybe it wasn't such a good idea after all. But I didn't think, or if I did, it was only from my little naive bubble where I couldn't possibly consider the outcome of such a thing. I wanted to meet Maul so much that it didn't even occur to me that he didn't exist in the first place. Things only started to seem off when I was actually walking up to his flat, when I saw what a state of disrepair the building was in. It wasn't exactly a wreck or anything, but all of Maul's pictures had made him look quite well off. That block of flats didn't seem like the kind of place a person like that would call home, but just the thought made me feel like I was being way too judgmental. The one moment of doubt I had, the one opportunity I really had to walk away and save myself, I just brushed off the idea like it was nothing. I followed my heart when I should have trusted my gut, and I ended up paying dearly for it. I found the apartment matching the number he'd given me and knocked on the door. There was a complete silence on the other side. Maybe it's a bit too hopeful of me to expect the sounds of smooth jazz and cooking when I arrive at the home of a potential date. A complete silence, hearing nothing gave me the creeps immediately. Then when someone answered the door, it was a total stranger. Not Maul, not even anyone who looked like him. It was just this chubby bearded bloke who somehow knew my name. It was so confusing that I didn't even know what to say at first. I was scared that I'd been catfished or something. But then, the guy addresses me by name, then invites me inside saying he's a friend of Maul's and that he'll be back in a few minutes. I'm still very hesitant to walk into his flat and I'm still thinking of something's really off here, but then the guy suddenly said something that put my mind at ease. His English was good, but heavily accented and he said something like, don't worry, I know you and Maul have a meeting together, I'll be leaving when he comes back, I promise. He sounded as warm and welcoming as possible and like I said, I actually found it quite reassuring at first. But the thing is, I might be an idiot, but I'm not a total idiot, so instead of going inside, I decided to politely decline. I told the guy that it'd be more comfortable waiting outside and that I'd give him all a call or something to see where he was. I thanked the guy, gave him a wave, and turned to walk back down the stairs, but I already knew it was too late. The look the guy gave me when I turned him down was chilling. He went from happy and smiley to completely expressionless in like a microsecond, and part of me knew right then that things were about to go horribly wrong. As I got about halfway down the stairs, I heard shouting coming from above me. It was a man's voice and he sounded very angry. I thought it was the man that I had been talking to who was now fuming that his catfish had been rumbled, and out of fear that he'd started chasing me down the stairs a la Patrick Bateman. I started basically running down the stairs to get out of there faster. 
I hadn't even got to the bottom yet when I realized that yes, the man was actually giving chase. But when I got onto the street outside, there were two police officers standing right in front of me, like my guardian angels had suddenly materialized right when I needed them most. I started to explain what was happening in the plainest, simplest English possible, hoping they'd be able to understand, but as I spoke, I suddenly realized that they were not there to help me. They were both giving me these absolute death stares, and I remember shouting, wait, 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 as one of them pulled out this big wooden baton. After that, my memory gets a bit patchy. I know they took me back up into the flat that I just walked away from, but honestly, I couldn't tell you if I walked or if they carried me. The next solid memory I have was being punched and kicked while the man who answered the door asked me questions in English. I remember trying to answer them as best as I could at first, but I could taste blood in my mouth, and anything I tried to say just came out as a kind of groan. I spit out the blood so I could speak, but that just made them beat me harder. Then the questions turned to my sexuality and the reasons I had traveled into the old town that evening. In that moment, it wasn't quite like their whole scheme came together before my eyes, but it definitely was a big clue for me. The invite from Mall had obviously been some kind of trick, and although I was sadly familiar with the concept of gay bashing back in the UK, the fact that the police were involved in whatever was going on was absolutely terrifying to me. It's a testament to how scared I was that when they actually put some handcuffs on me and dragged me out to a waiting police car, I was actually relieved. I thought that that'd be the end of the beatings and abuse, and the beginnings of some kind of official legal process, but it was only half right. They took any opportunity they could to punch me, kick me, or throw me into a wall, and when I asked what I was being charged with, they told me simply, debauchery. I didn't even know what debauchery even was at the time, let alone that there was a law against it in Egypt, and the fact I was completely in the dark about the whole thing meant my nerves were stretched to a breaking point for almost every minute that I was in that cell. I only really got an idea of what was going on when a man from the British Foreign Office turned up to have a chat with me. I never thought that I'd be so happy to see another English person, and at first, just being spoken to like a bloody human being was such a relief that I had to fight back tears for a while. His name was Martin, and as much as first meeting him was a real boost, the news he had for me wasn't good. Basically, Egypt had made it illegal to be intimate with someone outside of marriage. They call this law Article 9 or something. Officially, its purpose is to combat what they call adultery, but unofficially, it's the law that makes being gay a crime in the country, and if you're charged with an Article 9 related crime, a conviction can mean anything from six months to three years in prison. Just hearing the words three years in prison made me feel physically sick, and I think I was just about on the verge of a panic attack before Martin managed to calm me down. He told me not to worry, and that the foreign office was leveraging the Egyptian government on my behalf. However, they needed something from me, too. They needed me to remain almost completely silent. I was to say nothing about my sexuality, and if they asked me any other questions, my only answers were to be, I don't recall, or my intentions were purely platonic. I was to repeat these two phrases until I was blue in the face, and if I kept shtum, the police would eventually have no choice but to drop the charges. Martin talked like it was something he'd been through a hundred times, and that reassured me that everything would be okay, but also kept saying over and over again before he left, don't say a bloody thing. All this hinges on your silence. And he was right. But my god, did the Egyptian police use some dirty tricks to try and get a confession out of me. During the final period of questioning before they let me go, they told me things like, If you tell us you're gay and admit what you tried to do, we'll let you go. They tried acting so genuine, and it was sickening seeing how nice they could act, when all they wanted to do was put me in prison and slap me with a steep fine. I just did what Martin had asked me and in the end, they let me go. I'd rather not rehash the reunion with my nan, let's just say it was very emotional with a lot of tears and a lot of apologies. I spoke to Martin briefly on the phone before we were due to fly home and he assured me that no further charges would be filed. 
I thanked him for helping me, and he assured me that he was only doing his job, no different from all the other suits and ties that keep the wheels of government turning. But to me, he was so much more than that. To me, the man who appeared so calm and collected while I was at my breaking point, he was my hero. Even if he was the most unassuming hero you could dream of. What I'm about to tell you happened last year on Valentine's Day. I'm a female who lives by myself in a small house about 10 minutes outside of a major city. I've lived in this house for about three years now after moving from an apartment in another city. I had been single for a while and I hadn't really been dating at the time. I was mainly just focusing on work which was really busy at this time of the year. Then one morning, it happened to be Valentine's Day and I got up at about 6 a.m. like I usually did. When I stepped out of my front door, I noticed that there was a letter on my front step with a rose on top of it. I picked it up and saw that it had my name on it, but no return address. It was strange because at this early in the morning, I knew that somebody had to physically bring the letter and rose to my front step and not just mail it. I took them both inside and was really curious to find out who this was from. When I opened up the letter, my mood went from happy to creeped out. The letter was typed out and started out by complimenting me on my looks and also saying I was really nice. Then it went on to describe some of my daily activities and eventually whoever wrote it said that we were meant to be together. However, they never left their name and there was no indication at all of who it was from. I took a photo of it and sent it to a texting group chat that I had with several of my friends asking if one of them did it as a joke. I really didn't think they would do something like that and sure enough they all denied it but they did think it was pretty funny. I thought about all the people that it could have been, but I didn't really have any good ideas as to who it was. I decided to just move on and forget all about it. That night when I returned home from work, I once again saw something on my front step. There was a heart-shaped piece of paper, and it said on it, Why don't you spend Valentine's Day with me? I took it and went inside and called my best friend to tell her about it. We talked for a while, and it made me feel better. But a little while later, after hanging up, as I was in my living room, I heard a knock coming from my front door. It was nighttime by now, so it immediately got me suspicious. I went over to the front door, but nobody was there. I thought I saw out of the corner of my eye a man walking down the sidewalk in the other direction. Of course, I only saw him for a second, so I couldn't really give a description of him at all. I opened the door and there were no new letters or anything like that on the front step. I was now pretty concerned about whoever this was, but I didn't really know if it was grounds to call the police or anything like that. I hadn't been threatened or anything, so it seemed like it could have all just been a joke, and I didn't want to overreact. But still, I couldn't help but feel nervous about who it had been. I called my best friend back, and she offered to come over and stay the night with me, which I said yes to. She didn't live too far away, and was there within 15 minutes. There was no more activity the rest of the night, and the next day everything seemed fine. I went back to work like usual, and when I got home, I was happy to see that there were no letters or anything like that. I figured whatever had happened was just some Valentine's Day prank. I still wondered who it was though, but I was no longer really that concerned. But about two days later, as I got home from work, I once again saw a letter at my front doorstep. I got a bad feeling when I saw it. When I got inside, I opened up the letter. Inside the envelope, there was another handwritten note. It said, quote, I have been watching you. I hope you enjoyed my Valentine's Day card the other day. I also knocked on your door several times. And tomorrow when you get back from work, I will be back. I couldn't believe it when I read this, and I suddenly felt really freaked out like I wasn't alone. I ran straight from my front door and out to my car. When I was safely in my car, I drove to the nearest police station. I told everything to them, and they ended up investigating and having an officer stay near my house for a couple of days. I don't think they ever found out who was behind it all, but I never had anything like that happen again. A few years back, I went on a date with my girlfriend on Valentine's Day. We went out to a really nice and fancy restaurant. The restaurant was one of those that was pretty expensive and you needed to make reservations for. You also had to wear nice clothes. 
We didn't normally go to such nice restaurants, but on the special occasion of Valentine's Day, it was nice. Our plan was for after dinner to go to a movie. When we were leaving the restaurant and going out to my car in the parking lot, I saw there was a man standing kind of next to my car. I was parked kind of in the back of the parking lot, so I was sort of surprised to see this. The man was wearing a suit and saw me walking towards him but didn't say anything. I guessed maybe he was waiting for someone or something like that. He was probably about six feet away from the passenger side of my car, and when I got close to him, I said hi. The man didn't say hi back to me, though. He just kind of looked away and sort of took a few steps farther. We got in and drove away to a movie theater that was about 10 minutes away. The movie theater was pretty busy, and after we had gotten our seats, I left to go to the bathroom. As I was walking down the hall of the movie theater, I saw the same man in a suit once again. He was just kind of standing near the bathrooms looking in another direction. He never looked at me at all, and as I got closer, I was sure it was him. I went to the bathroom and then walked back to the theater where my girlfriend was, and I told her about seeing the man. She thought that I was joking at first and started laughing until I told her that I was serious. We didn't really know what to make of it, but just hoped that it was a strange coincidence, and for the most part, we ended up forgetting about it. When the movie was over, we left the theater, and we didn't see the man at all in the theater or the parking lot. We got back to my apartment to watch some TV and have some drinks. I would say about an hour after getting back, as I was changing channels on the TV, my girlfriend asked me to come and look out the window. I walked over to it and looked outside down below. I lived on the third floor, so it was sort of high up, but not really way up there. I saw on the side of the road was the same man in a suit just standing there. Now I knew this couldn't be a coincidence. This time, it appeared he was on the phone. I knew without a doubt that this was the same guy, and we were both really creeped out now. I had enough at this point, and decided to go downstairs and confront the man. I left the apartment and walked down the stairs into the lobby. Then I went out the door to the street where the man was. But when I got there, he was gone. I walked down the street a little bit and looked all around. I couldn't find him, so I went back up to the apartment and asked my girlfriend if she saw which way the man went. She said that he walked closer to the apartment building, and then he went out of sight. This was concerning because to us there was a strong possibility that the man was inside our apartment building. It took me a long time to fall asleep that night, but nothing strange happened until I finally did fall asleep. I had dozed off at probably about 2 a.m., but was awoken to the sound of a knock on our apartment door. I quietly got up and walked over to it. I looked out the peephole, but saw no one. My girlfriend and I both knew it had to be the man in the suit, but what did he want from us? The rest of the night, there were no more knocks. In fact, we never did see that man again, but I always wonder who he was and why we kept seeing him. This happened last year, a few days before Valentine's Day. I was 18 years old at the time, and I was a very shy kid. It seemed that every girl I saw ignored me or just didn't really want to talk to me. Anyway, I was at a restaurant with my best friend at the time who I called John. We were talking about a bunch of different things, but mainly sports. Eventually, I asked him about some dating advice. I knew I could ask him about this sort of thing because at the time he had a girlfriend. I told John I was sick and tired of being ignored by every girl, and John told me to take out my phone. He took his out as well and told me about the dating site he used to meet his girlfriend. John helped me by explaining how to make a good profile and things like that. A few hours later, I was at my house in my room setting up the profile. I tried to find the nicest picture of myself that I could, and when I did, I used it for my profile. Then I used the app for a while and hoped to get some matches. I decided to watch some TV in my room after that, sitting on my bed, waiting for my phone to go off saying I had matched with someone. I was skeptical and didn't really think that it would work, but after about just a minute, there was a ding from my phone. I grabbed my phone to look and see what it was. I saw the message was from the dating website, and it said someone had matched with me. When I clicked on it, I saw I had matched with a girl named Eva. I clicked on her profile and saw that there was a picture of Eva. She was my same age and had black hair and bright blue eyes. She was also wearing a blue dress and she was smiling, showing off her bright white teeth. I felt myself smile. This was the first girl who I was about to talk to, 
so I decided to send her a simple hello to start the chat between us. A minute later, Eva sent a hello back. We ended up chatting, and she seemed really nice. I then asked Eva if I could meet her in real life and not just chat with her, and she actually said yes. She told me I could meet her at her house, and then she gave me her house address. She told me I could come over that very same night if I wanted to. I said yeah and gave her a thumbs up. I stopped chatting with Eva and started getting ready. It was a bit cold outside that night, so I put some warm clothes on. I then grabbed my phone from my bed and hopped into my car. I messaged Eva telling her I was on my way over. As I was driving down the road, I kept thinking about how lucky I was I was going to meet a girl on the first night of using the dating app, and I was excited about what John was going to say when I told him about it. As I continued driving to Eva's house, I suddenly realized that the road I was driving on was becoming more and more empty and just woods. I passed by houses every several minutes, but there were barely any street lights, and it seemed that I was heading into the middle of nowhere. In fact, it took me almost an hour to get to her house. When I got there, I texted Eva telling her I was there and got out of my car. When I looked up at the house I was standing in front of, it looked like it would cave in at any second. I had a bad feeling, but I decided to keep going up to the front door. As I did, I noticed the grass that was in the front lawn was knee height. I sent Eva another message. I told her I was in front of the house and told her to tell me if this was the right address. She sent a message saying yes, she was there, and to just go inside and call out her name. I grabbed the doorknob and let it slowly creak open walking inside the house. I noted that it was dark and dusty inside. I didn't see Eva or anyone else, and then I tried to send Eva another message, but the app wouldn't work. The Wi-Fi signal was down, and I wasn't really getting any service on my phone. I decided to walk around to see if I could find her, so I headed into the living room. I saw a bunch of old furniture, and then I noticed hanging from the ceiling was a bright blue dress. I noticed it was the same one that Eva had been wearing in a couple of the photos she had on her profile. Then I saw a black wig hanging from the dress. It made me really confused because Eva's hair was black in the pictures. I called out Eva, hoping she would hear my voice. But just then, in the deepest and creepiest tone, I heard a yes from behind me. I nearly jumped and hit the ceiling. I turned around, but I didn't see Eva. The only person standing in front of me wasn't a girl. It was a guy wearing a black hoodie. He had the hood up and was wearing blue jeans. I noticed he had brown hair and he gave me a creepy smile and winked. I asked who he was, but he didn't say anything. He just pointed at the blue dress and the wig, grinning at me with the darkest smile that a human could. Then I noticed he had something in his hand. It appeared to be a gun. He told me in a deep voice to hand over everything I had on me. Then he pulled out a bag. I didn't want to argue with him, so I pulled everything out of my pockets and dropped them into his bag, even the watch I was wearing. The man then started to walk away from me. Pretty soon, I watched him walk out the front door. I was relieved, but also still terrified. Finally, I was able to get my legs to move again, and I ran out to my car as fast as I could. Luckily, I didn't see that freak again, but he had all of my stuff. I drove all the way back to John's house and told him everything. From there, he called the police, and when they arrived, I told them everything. As it turns out, the man who had lured me into the house was also pretending to be the Eva girl, and she didn't really exist. That's why I saw the blue dress and the wig in the living room of the house. The house also didn't belong to the man, and it was an old abandoned one. The scary thing is, the police never found the guy. But since it happened, I stopped using dating apps. Was there ever anyone in your town or neighborhood that your mom and dad warned you to stay away from? For a lot of people my age, there's almost always someone they were warned about during their childhood. For some, it's a neighbor or a certain person in town, and in some more sinister cases, it's a teacher, maybe even an uncle. But for me and the rest of the kids in our small Yorkshire town, it was John Cutter. Cutter, as we used to call him, was said to live in this old farmer's cottage a few miles out of town. We'd see him around town every so often, but he'd never talk to anyone. 
and that was a fixture in our town. Everybody rabbiting on to everyone else. A five minute journey to the shops for a pint of milk might well take a half an hour depending on who you met along the way. For that reason alone, going anywhere with my mom was a huge pain. She'd stop and talk to almost everyone we walked past. But not cut her. Never ever cut her. For years I really didn't think anything of it. But what I do remember is going into town one day to buy a football with my mom. As we were walking back down the high street, I disobeyed my mom and started dribbling it back to the car. At some point, I lost control of it, and it ended up rolling down the high street and stopping just outside a pub. I ran to collect it, and by that point, it was sitting right at the feet of none other than John Cutter. Um, can I have my ball back, please? Cutter just stared at me, and then looked at the ball, then back at me, not saying a word. I remember thinking that he mustn't have heard me, so I asked him again. Immediately after, I feel my mom grab me by the arm and march me away. She drags me all the way back to the car park and starts telling me how I'm never, ever to talk to that man ever again. I didn't think I'd done anything wrong, but here mom was telling me off worse than when I'd smashed the neighbor's window. The whole way home, I cried my bloody eyes out, but the message was loud and clear. Stay away from John Cutter. Then, around my teenage years, right when I was getting into that whole rebellious bugger-off mom and dad phase, I ended up seeing where Cutter actually lived. It was an absolute mess, but that got me thinking that the reason no one liked Cutter was because he was just poor, a socially awkward and a bit scabby-looking fellow. I thought the same thing about the kid in the school other children used to bully, and I always felt just sorry for him. It wasn't his fault he had allergies and his nose was always runny and minging. And to me, the grown-ups in our town were doing exactly the same thing to Cutter. Not that I launched some campaign to change his image or anything, I just saw it as the oppressive conformist majority singling out and excluding someone who didn't live in the exact same way as them. Like I said, I didn't act on it. It just made me angry. So, in May of 1996, I'm 13 years old. I'm in my second year of secondary school, and it's almost the start of the summer holidays. I finish school on Friday afternoon, and as I'm making the short walk home, I notice there's an unusual amount of people in cars out on the streets at a time when it was normally just us school kids. So I've already got this sense that something isn't quite right as I hop the back gate of my house and walk around to the kitchen. Stepping inside, I'm greeted by the sight of my mom sat at our kitchen table. She's on the phone with someone, a box of Kleenex with a few used tissues around, and it's evident that she's been crying. I asked if she's alright. She hangs up the phone, then tells me something terrible has happened. Every year, once the weather turned nice, the local primary school would take its year sixes, that's fifth graders to you Americans, down to an old abbey not far from town. It's one of the oldest in the entire British Isles, so it's a huge tourist trap and it's a big source of pride for the people around town. I'd taken part in the trip when I was that age too. Not most kids' idea of fun, but there were definitely worse school trips to go on. That Friday had been that year's year six turn to go down to the abbey. About 50, 10, and 11 year olds were bussed down there in the late morning and one didn't come back. Her name was Jenny Campbell. She was ten years old and the entire town went into a frenzy trying to find her. That's why the streets were so busy. Word had gotten around fast and people had just headed down to the abbey in their droves to help in the search. When the sun started going down, my dad and uncle ended up going down too with torches and whistles. I went to bed hoping poor Jenny would be found, at least so everything could go back to normal. But by the next morning, things only got worse. Overnight, a volunteer rescue worker had found Jenny's coat in some woodland, not too far from the abbey. Police were appealing for witnesses to come forward, scouring the area around the abbey with dogs. It was like a blue and yellow circus had come to town, honestly. Police cars of all different sizes were driving through town all day, and a load of them were basically camped outside of Jenny's parents' house. But they didn't find her the next day, or the next and after she'd been missing for a full week, 
I think people started to assume the worst. Less and less police seemed to be hanging around town, and people were definitely talking about it much less. Not so much because they weren't thinking about it, but because the idea of little Jenny not coming back was just too much to bear. I understood it was a really serious thing, but being the daft 13 year old that I was, all I could give a toss about was the fact that I hadn't been allowed to play out for an entire week. Not long, I know, but to a kid that seems like forever. So when my mom and dad finally relaxed enough to let me play out with my mates, we had an absolute field way with it. What followed was basically stand by me, but if it was set in 90s Yorkshire, although I feel like I should assure you from the get-go that there were no close calls with train bridges and no one found any dead bodies. For obvious reasons, my mom had forbidden us from going down to the abbey, but tell a teenage boy he can't go somewhere, that's just basically planting a seed right there, and as soon as one of my mates suggested that we go look for Jenny, that was all it took for us to march on the abbey. For me, it was when a mate of mine said, what if we find her, just at the last minute and we save her from dying? We'd be heroes, boys. Heroes. And you know what? He was right. I couldn't understand why people hadn't found her yet, how the police could just appear to stop looking when a little girl went missing. So, off we went looking for Jenny Campbell, and for our sins, we found her. Right when we reach the forest near the abbey, I tell the boys to hold their horses for a minute while I run off for a wee. After I'm done, I hear two people walking through the trees, only from the opposite direction my mates are. Two thoughts go through my head. One, what horrible prank have they got planned since they're sneaking up behind me, obviously, while I'm half done? And two, how in God's name have they managed to sneak around and approach from a totally different direction? I do my pants up and turn around, already in the middle of saying, what kind of bloody woof does are you? sneaking up on me while I'm having a... But when I see who it is, I'm stunned into silence. It was Cutter, and he's holding the hand of a little girl who looked exactly like Jenny Campbell. John Cutter, the local pariah, the one people made nasty rumors about, he was about to be a hero. Cutter, you, you found her. It was the first and last thing I ever said to him. Not quite loud enough to alert my mates apparently, but loud enough for him to hear. He hadn't actually seen me until I spoke, and when I did, he and Jenny stopped and turned to look at me. It was only then that I noticed how Jenny didn't seem very happy to be rescued. She looked exhausted, pale and terrified, with cuts and bruises all over her arms and legs. Maybe she was just too shaken up to feel celebratory just yet. If she'd been out there for a week on her own, there's no telling what she'd had to do to survive. Then, Cutter spoke in a low voice, addressing me by name. I have no idea how he knew what my name was, and I was stunned into silence for the rest of what he said, and I'm guessing you'll see why. It was a long time ago, so this might not be exactly what he said, but it's the gist of it. You're Johnny, aren't you? He said. I just nodded. And you live on that cul-de-sac near Dodd's farm, don't you? Again, I just nodded, noticing that he was holding Jenny's wrist a little bit too tight. And your mom, she works in town, doesn't she? In that little charity shop, all alone in the daytime? I just nodded. I didn't really know what he was getting at, but it was certainly having its intended effect. You're going to tell everyone I found the girl, he told me. Because I did. Didn't I, Jenny? Jenny just flinched when Cutter said her name, and he had to repeat himself to get a response which amounted to nothing more than a whimper. Jenny's been lost, you see. See, the little thing wandered off on that school trip, and she'd been sleeping in the woods all on her own, all week. Isn't that right, Jenny? Yeah, Jenny said, and the way her eyes fell made me think that wasn't quite the truth. So if you're going to say anything else, little lad, whose mom works all alone in that quiet little charity shop, if you're going to go telling something different, that'd be a lie, wouldn't it? And if you were to go telling lies about me, that'd make me very, 
very angry. Cutter continued to just stare me out until I nodded my head and murmured in agreement. Good boy. No excuses. This little girl had missed her mummy and daddy very much and I think she'd like to see them. And with that, he walked off, leading Jenny by that unusually tight-looking grip. I wandered back to my mates who promptly asked me what had taken so long. When I told them, I wasn't all that surprised that they didn't believe me, not first anyway. But when I gave them this attitude of, you just wait and see, don't take my word for it, and they saw I wasn't lying. So, Cutter found Jenny Campbell? Who'd have guessed? One of my mates said. I guess he's going to be the hero now then, isn't he? The three of them started going back and forth about how he deserved it after all, if he'd been the one to actually find her. They definitely deserved some credit, didn't it? It took me a minute or two to actually find the words to say it, like you have to understand how conflicted I was. Shut up and let him take the credit, and I'd get the biggest I told you so moment over my family. Speak up, and I'd be defending someone genuinely evil. But I had to. What other choice did I have? I had this strong sense of morality. I couldn't possibly back someone I thought was guilty of God knows what. Guys, I remember saying, I don't think Cutter found her. Well, who did? I think there were a lot of words I could have used, a lot of ways I could have phrased it. I opted for the one that kept my delicate sensibilities intact. I think Cutter took Jenny Campbell. I then had to explain to them exactly what he'd said to me, but with added emphasis on the way he said it. I might have been young, but I wasn't stupid. Something was wrong but it wasn't like I was in a position to say anything. If he was psycho enough to take a little girl like that, he was psycho enough to hurt me or my mom to keep us quiet. But then again, if I didn't say anything, he might go on to hurt someone else. The census was clear. Go to the police as soon as possible, tell them everything, and then get whatever protection me and my family might require. But I'm ashamed to say that when I got home, I just completely bottled it. I'd have to start the whole thing off by admitting to mom that I disobeyed her, and then I'd be following it up with accusing the bloke who rescued Jenny Campbell of being something I can't even say here. I got it into my head that it'd look like I was trying to make excuses for myself by making what was the worst accusation possible. It wasn't looking good for me, so I bottled it up inside. I just went upstairs, tried to take my mind off it, and failed miserably in the attempt. On top of that, I could barely sleep. I mean, could you if you were faced with that kind of dilemma? So that night, about one in the morning, I sneak out of bed and grab a cigarette from my little stash of them under my bed. I open up my window and sit, actually quite dangerous now that I think about it, right on the edge so my room doesn't end up smelling of smoke. Needless to say, the nicotine didn't really help with the stress, but... I was feeling moody and angsty, so it suited the aesthetic, I suppose. Then right as I'm smoking, someone walks underneath the streetlight just down the road. Someone who looked creepily familiar. But I'm thinking, it can't be him. It really can't be him. But it was. It was Cutter, and he walked right past our driveway and looked right up at me as he did. I was only leaning out the window for like five minutes tops and I don't believe in coincidences so I'd be willing to bet it wasn't the first time he'd walked by my house. I was so scared that I almost fell out of the window trying to clamber back inside before he saw me but it was no use. He knew where I lived. I was relying on Jenny Campbell telling whatever truth there was to be told but when word actually did get around that he was the hero that found her. I found it more and more difficult to speak up about what I'd seen, or rather, what I suspected had happened. They didn't exactly throw him a parade or anything, but there was a story about in the local paper, and a mention on a regional nightly news channel. 
The hype came and went in about a week or two, and although Cutter didn't get any more social after the fact, people's attitudes around him definitely changed. Then that was it. For years. The story remained the same, and neither me nor Jenny had anything else to say about it. At least until Cutter died, and then it all came out. I could probably write a whole nother report about how the whole thing happened, but let's just say it was ugly. Really bloody ugly. A lot of shouting and screaming, a lot of tears, and a whole bunch of regret. A lot of people told me I should have done things that I'm not sure they'd have done, if they were in my position at least. That was probably the most frustrating part, trying to explain to my mom that I kept my mouth shut about it. For her. And I suppose that brings us to the moral of what happened to me, or rather mainly to Jenny, and to the whole reason I wrote this up in the first place. It's always, always better to tell the truth and face the consequences of something than to keep your mouth shut. My dad explained it like a bank account. He put the truth in a box and hide it away, only it will accrue interest for as long as it's hidden, until one day you let that truth out, and it's bigger and badder and more hurtful than it ever could have been otherwise. His way of explaining it summed things up perfectly, and if I could go back and do things different, I would. I'd be much, much braver and just tell the truth, so that we'd all feel that some semblance of justice was done. I'm a 14-year-old female. This happened during English two weeks after the summer holidays ended. We were learning about Charles Dickens when some kids in my class pointed at some guy on a bike doing willies past the classroom, and he was looking into the room. Our teacher just told us to ignore him and carried on with the lesson. Five minutes go by, and a girl in my class suddenly screamed and pointed out to the guy who was now next to the window I was sat next to, but he quickly biked off. Our teacher pulled the blinds down and turned the lights on to carry on with the lesson. I had asked to take a time out outside next to the set of stairs that led up to the language rooms. When I sat down next to my girlfriend, I had heard a knock at the set of double doors on my left. I then hear a male voice who sounded around 16, asking to be let in, while also trying his luck at the door handles. Luckily, they were locked as always. I went back into my classroom and my teacher informed me that our head teacher had called the police and that they were now on their way. We were starting to pack up for our next period when we then heard bangings at the windows, and I heard the same voice from the doors yelling some random words and cussing at us. The bell rang for next period, and the banging then stopped. Time skipped to when I meant science in the middle of a practical, when my best friend then pointed out that there were police outside. Our chemistry teacher came over to have a look herself. So apparently the guy from before sped off after we made eye contact. I found it a bit creepy as I was on the other side of school, and then now that's where he magically appeared. I later found out from my girlfriend that the guy had been appearing on school grounds for the past two weeks, but nobody had mentioned anything about it. She also mentioned that apparently the police noticed he had a weapon on him, to this day, I still dread to think what would have happened if those doors were unlocked. This happened around December of 2019, at 7th period on my last day of the semester. Our school had a basement and led to other classes that kids would try to get into, because they were apparently really easy and had the best air conditioning. We had a test on that class and got done quickly because I found it very easy. I decided to text my friend who we'll call Cole to get a pass and meet me in the bathrooms to have vapes. I asked the teacher for a pass and met up with him in the bathroom. Just before we got out our vapes, Cole's phone gets a text message. The message then said that we're on a lockdown. Cole and I wanted to see what it was like in the halls. We looked and it was almost pitch black out there. The windows are only in the classrooms, but not in the hallways. We then thought then this must be serious. 
There was a man walking out there, and he didn't look like a worker or a janitor. We went into the bathroom, turned off the lights, and then hid in one of the corner stalls. The room was completely silent. We then heard the bathroom open and close. The noise of him walking went to the stall that we were in. Cole then said, Dude, we have to crawl out from the stalls. The room was so silent that even Cole's whisper can be heard from across the room. The guy's breathing stopped, and we heard the stall being pressed in. I said, Dude, go, go, and then crawled through the stalls. The man was now full on banging the stall, as well as yelling. The door then opened as we were leaving, and the light filled the room, and I saw that the guy was in the hallway. We pounded on the door to Cole's class until they opened the door. Cole then explained everything as the teacher locked the door, also mentioning a gun sticking out of his pocket. I didn't see a gun on him, but I just went along with it. Usually middle and high school students would laugh for making a scene like this, but the kids in the corner were quite scared and concerned. There was a bang at the door, and a few of the girls would squeal from fear. Cole, the teacher, and I saw the man at the door trying the doorknob and banged out of frustration. He then walked away and down the stairs. We have probably been there for about an hour or two at this point. The teacher instructed us to go outside in a single file where everyone would be greeted by cops. Cole and I tried to explain the guy's appearance to the cops and the deans. The cops patted us on the back and sent us home. After that incident... The school ramped up with security and added cameras. This never got any media attention, so we don't really know if the guy got caught or not. I'm absolutely convinced that guy's intention was nothing but to kill us. When I was in third grade, my history class took a field trip to an old mansion. I don't even remember exactly why we were there, but it was kind of in the city, and I think it was like 200 years old. We got inside, and we were given a tour first. When I say it was a mansion, I really mean it was a mansion. It had two floors, a basement and an attic, with about 10 bedrooms and 5 bathrooms. It also had lots of other rooms, like a library, several offices and living rooms, and a large kitchen. There was about 15 of us in the class, and after the tour, they let us look around on the main floor. They weren't watching us that closely, however, and I wanted to see the upstairs again, so I just walked up there by myself when no one was looking. Once I got upstairs, I noticed the smell that old buildings have oftentimes. I began looking at the bedrooms. I enjoyed history, and the house was actually very interesting to me. After looking at several bedrooms upstairs, I entered one on the end. I walked over to the window to see the view, but when I did, I heard a noise coming from the closet. I was a little confused and looked over at the closet. It was a really old closet and I didn't know what would be making the noise, so I started to open it, but then I really got the creeps and I decided to leave the room. I began to walk back out of the hall and when I did, I heard footsteps coming from the room. I turned around, and what I saw was a man standing in the doorway of the room, staring at me. He was wearing a black shirt, gray pants, and just stood in the doorway and gave me a creepy smile. I turned and ran as fast as I could down the hall, downstairs, and back to the group. I don't know who that man was, but I really don't want to know. When I was a freshman in college, I had to take a geology class. For the class, we went on a field trip for extra credit. I'm not the best at science, so I figured I should go on the field trip to boost my grade a little. We went to a park that I guess had many different kinds of rock formations or something. It was an old park and the professor gave us all a little checklist with a worksheet and after briefing us for a few minutes, sent us out to complete the worksheets. 
There was about 20 of us in the class, and the park was pretty big, so we all spread out. I went with my friend John, and we decided to go far out to fill out the worksheet. We went up a hill and over some rocks and started working. We were actually able to complete it pretty quickly, as it was a pretty easy assignment. After we were done, we decided to explore a little. We walked for a few minutes and then came upon a large man that was walking down the trail. He approached us and told us that his friend had passed out and needed our help. He said his phone was dead and we needed to follow him quickly. Without hesitating, we followed the man. He started to run and so did we. After about two or three minutes of jogging, we came upon a little wooded area. The man stopped and said his friend was behind a tree. We didn't see anybody, however. We looked around for a couple seconds, but then to my surprise, I saw several men come out from behind the trees in all directions. They were all rather large, and one of them was holding a stick in his hand. The original man we were with then told us to give them our wallets and phones. My friend John told him no. A man then came up to John and pushed him to the ground. I tried talking to them, saying to relax. They then all began to yell at us. We were surrounded, and finally, I decided to give in and took out my wallet and phone and handed him to one of the men. John did the same. They then told us to walk farther into the woods. I knew we had to try to run away. I whispered to John to run when we had a chance. We were still surrounded, so I pretended to trip over a rock and fall to the ground. When I did, I acted as if I hurt my leg really bad. They yelled at me to get up, but I said I couldn't and they started to walk closer to look at me. At that point, the attention was taken off John and he turned and ran, and I got up and ran between two of the men. It was pretty close, but I was able to escape. They all began running after us then. We ran as fast as we could. We ran and ran, and we could hear the men behind us the entire time. Finally, we approached the hill we were originally at. We then started yelling, and the men had stopped chasing us. We got back to the group, but the men still had our phones and wallets. After reporting the incident, they were able to actually track my iPhone to an old house, and two of the men were caught. It was the scariest field trip memory of my life.